Oxford, the city of dreaming spires, set in the heart of England and home to the world-renowned University of Oxford. It's the oldest university in the English-speaking world, dating back to the 11th and 12th centuries. The first colleges, University College, Merton and Balliol, were established in the 13th century, and by the 14th century, Oxford was respected as the world's foremost centre of learning. Oxford has not only been a centre of great academic excellence over the centuries, it's also been the focus for huge debates and controversies, often of a theological and religious nature. In the 14th century, the master of Balliol College, John Wycliffe, wanted to translate the Bible into the common vernacular, very much against the wishes of the Pope at the time. During the reign of Mary, Queen of Scots in the 16th century, the then bishops of Canterbury, London and Worcester were martyred for their support of the Protestant Reformed faith. Cranmer, Latimer, Ridley were martyred, burnt at the stake, right here in Broad Street. Just round the corner is the Eagle and Child, the favoured watering hole of possibly the 20th century's most famous Christian apologist, C.S. Lewis. He and fellow Oxford writers, including J.R.R. Tolkien, became known as the Inklings, and they met here every week to discuss their writings and ideas. They were the first to receive proof manuscripts of Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe in June 1950. From 1942 to 1954, Lewis also was president of the Oxford Socratic Club. There, each Monday evening of the term time, he would defend the Christian faith in the midst of those challenges presented by agnostics and atheists. Recently, those with a more atheistic agenda, quite overt, people like the chemist Professor Peter Atkins, the Darwinian biologist Professor Richard Dawkins, have been very successful and vigorous in their campaign to support the creed of atheism. Equally, there are many other leading academics here in Oxford who do believe in God. People who have argued persuasively and passionately for God's existence and the truth of the Christian faith. I've enjoyed two periods here in the university as a student. Recently, as a fellow, I've got to know three of these academics very well. These men all hold professorial chairs in their own disciplines. They've taught, lectured, written, debated and broadcast in defence of the Christian faith. These men, Professor John Lennox, Professor Keith Ward and Professor Alistair McGrath, are to be my guests in a series of discussions all based around themes of Christian apologetics. To record them, we've come south to Dorset and to Canford School, my place of work. We're one of the country's leading independent senior co-educational boarding schools. And for over 20 years, I've been the head of religious studies, teaching theology, philosophy, and critical thinking skills. My students, like so many other people today, are wrestling with important questions related to the existence of God, science and religion, knowledge and faith, and philosophical worldviews. Questions that I'll be discussing with my guests. So let's meet them. Professor Alistair McGrath, you uh, hold the chair at the moment as uh, for theology and ministry at London. And I know you've had up to 30 years experience at Oxford in academic life there. But before you actually were engaged in uh, theology, your academic interests lay elsewhere. What was that about? Well, I started studying science. Uh, I studied science at high school, then went to Oxford to study chemistry for four years, and then did a doctoral research programme in molecular biophysics. And for me, the sciences were just so exciting that really they, they captivated me. And it was while studying them that actually I began to discover there were other exciting things in life as well. So you start, you got a doctorate in molecular biology? 
That's right, yes. Was it? And then things changed, because I remember reading in one of your books that certain things unsettled your thinking to the extent that you moved on to theology and a particular change came about. Tell us about that change. Well, when I was a, a younger, when I was a teenager, I, I was a very aggressive atheist. And at high school, I took the view, well, look, science proves there is no God, religion is for losers. And so it seemed to me absolutely obvious that science inexorably led to atheism. I went up to Oxford to begin studying science seriously, and as I began to do that in much more detail, I began to realize that things weren't as simple as I'd thought. And to cut a very long story short, I began to realize that atheism was a faith position, and actually it wasn't even a very good faith position. And in many ways, my, my scientific interest led me to discover religious faith. I became a Christian, and that actually changed everything for me. So your change of mind and heart and the way you saw things moved from the sciences to theology, but it wasn't as if you were abandoning scientific interest. You say your science led you to that. Well, very much so. Science, in effect, was something I loved. When I discovered God, that kind of way led me to see science in a new way. And so I went on to study theology, partly because I felt this will help me engage with science in more detail. It will bring intellectual depth to my study of science. And so for me, since then, the whole question of science and faith has really been very important. Well, it's interesting. We're seated here between the science blocks and the humanities blocks here at Camford. So you're actually saying that there's no problem weighing up your scientific interest, your doctorate in that, and your, sci and your theology. They're part and parcel of the same worldview. They're like left hand and right hand. They're different, but they're connected to the same person. And for me, the great thing about the Christian faith is it gives you, if you like, a, a set of spectacles that allow you to focus in on the world, including science and also the humanities, and it means you see them more clearly and sharper focus than you otherwise would. Now, I've read a number of your books, and in fact we sat down for dinner together in Oxford a couple of months ago, and I put to you the question... Uh, how many books have you written? And uh, either you're being very coy or you genuinely didn't know. Have you any idea how many books you've written? Chris, I don't know. Uh, what I do know is people seem to enjoy reading them and keep asking me to write more. Right, and I know that in this last year you've penned, I think, three or four at least in this year. Well, that's right, including a, another book trying to engage with the so-called new atheism and really just saying, look, this has been around for a few years. Where's it going? It's run out of steam in my view. But that's another story. One of your books, uh, you really did take Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, the uh, Oxford professor, to task over his work, The God Delusion. And as I read both The God Delusion and your response to that, I was reminded very much of the words of Aristotle and Plato. Uh, Aristotle, uh, one of Plato's uh, tutees, and he spoke in the words of his eulogy, he said how much he valued his friend and valued the truth, but respect and reverence for truth was most paramount. And the reason I thought of that is that reading your critique of Dawkins, you seem to be very generous to him, very uh, appreciative of his work, but you're very, very, very thorough in your dismissal of his uh, ideas in The God Delusion. Yes, I think it's extremely important always to respect somebody as a person. I mean, yeah. if someone says to you, you believe in God, therefore you're a fool, or you're an atheist, therefore you're a fool, I mean, you just cannot take that seriously. Yeah. For me, Dawkins is a very important, a very significant writer. You must take him seriously, but you must take him sufficiently seriously to be able to say, this is wrong. That's what I try to say in that book, graciously, I hope, but also mm -hmm. forcibly. There are points where simply he's wrong. Another book you've written recently, which I, I enjoyed reading, uh, Mere Theology, you spoke about the role of Christian apologetics, people who defend the Christian faith, people who put forward reasons for believing the Christian faith. And in that you said the role of Christian apology, apologetics is not merely to win an argument, but basically to see changes of heart and mind. Could you unpack that for us a bit? What do you mean by that? I think it's extremely important to say that the Christian faith is not simply about engaging with somebody's mind. It goes far deeper. It captivates our imaginations, it engages our emotions, and it really connects up with our hearts as much as our minds. I could win an argument with you, but I wouldn't win you as a person. And for me, the really important thing is to say that Christianity 
doesn't just make rational sense. It actually transforms the way in which we think, the way in which we engage with reality. It engages our hearts, not just our minds. So arguing is only a very small part of the strategy. We need to show how Christianity transforms everything. So do you hope that within this series of discussions we're going to hold, there is going to be some clearly defensive element, countering arguments, but beyond that there'll be some positive things to say and will that come out, do you think, in our discussions? I very much think so. We'll be showing, I think, that Christianity makes sense in itself, that it makes sense of everything else as well, but not in a purely defensive way, rather as a way of saying, look, there are real questions being asked, let's show that answers can be given, but let's also show that if these answers are right, then this changes everything. Alistair, thank you very much indeed. Professor Keith Ward, Regis Professor of Divinity Emeritus at Oxford University. Grand title. Unpack two terms for me in that, Regis and Emeritus. Well, Regis uh, means appointed by the Queen, and uh, I was. I don't know that she did it personally, but she signed the letter, and um, right. uh, so that's what that means. And Emeritus, uh, well, if you've been there long enough, you can be made Emeritus. It really means retired and past it. Um, <laughs> But uh, so, so it's not I'm a retired uh, professor right. of divinity at Oxford. Yeah. Now, I do know that when you were appointed to that seat in uh, Oxford, that you wrote in one of your books a rather, I thought, humorous exchange you had with Richard Dawkins. Tell us about that. Well, I thought it was humorous. Uh, well, it was, uh, he wrote a letter to the Times saying that I should uh, um, resign my chair because there shouldn't uh, be a stupid person like me in Oxford anyway. And the reason for that was that there'd been a correspondence in the Times about the three kings at Christmas and various people say did they exist or not and I wrote a letter which I, was meant to be a joke saying I knew there were three kings because I'd seen their tomb in Cologne Cathedral okay. and that was what got Richard's uh, ire up and uh, he thought nobody who believes that sort of thing deserves a chair in Oxford. He also thought I must say that there wasn't such a subject as theology so there was no point in me being there in the first place. So you've had one or two ding-dongs with the good professor? Uh, I think that's true yes yeah. uh, we have and a few public debates in Oxford and uh, I think we could call them an honourable draw which I won. <laughs> I see. Now <laughs> Christchurch College in Oxford, a fabulous place, lovely environment uh, used by the Harry Potter films, I think. That's true. But if you're settled in that very ivory tower existence as an academic there, what real sense of engagement have you got with the man in the street who worries about issues of science, faith and what's true? Yeah. Well, it's not all that ivory tower. For a start, the College Chapel happens to be the cathedral of the largest diocese in England. So it is a cathedral, another canon there, and so took services, preached sermons, etc. And also, I've been a minister of the Church of England for quite a long time now, about 30 years, I suppose. Uh, and I've always worked in the local church where I've lived. And so, you know, that's kept my feet on the ground right. or among the pews. But at least it's different from an ivory tower. So oh, right. I think it's been very helpful, actually, to, to have an academic job and then work in a church as well and try to have to explain yourself to people. So you um, can't speak merely in high fluting languages? No, but, right. you can't really. No. Okay. No. Now, one of your books I also read about your earlier years when you were, as you said, a very settled atheist. Yeah. And certain things caused you to change your mind on that. And being a Church of England clergyman now, I presume you have changed your mind. Tell us uh, about that. Well, uh, I suppose part of the reason I was an atheist was because I taught philosophy. I was a lecturer in philosophy. And most philosophers at that time were atheists or said they were, or the ones who weren't atheists kept quiet anyway. So that was the fashionable thing to be. But the more I studied the arguments, not just about God, but about the nature of the human person, the nature of the universe, the quite big questions like that, mm -hmm. the more I thought that the standard arguments against God and against thinking there was uh, some direction or purpose in the universe and against thinking that human beings were more than just bits of matter stuck together, right? all those arguments uh, supporting materialism were pretty poor. I mean, they weren't very good arguments. So that was part of it. I just came to feel that the good arguments uh, may be uh, against material. So you're saying philosophy changed your mind? Yeah, it did. Right. Yeah. Well, it made me open. Yes. I mean, actually, I confess it, I was converted, right? So yes. I had an experience of a spiritual presence and power, which I think was 
the person of Jesus. So that's the truth. Yeah. Uh, but that, I wouldn't have been open to that if, I hadn't, if the ground hadn't been prepared by my thinking such a thing wasn't a mad delusion. Right. <laughs> it could actually be authentic. But you also drew attention to the fact that part of the philosophy you were rejecting um, was aligning itself in some ways with, um, well, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that you had a, a view that uh, so much evil in this world and uh, was brought about by a godless worldview. Well, I think for anybody who believes in God, evil is an issue you really have to spend a lot of time trying to understand. Yeah. But I think it's pretty clear, or it seemed clear to me, that a, a lot of evil in the world is done by human beings. And it's human beings' greed and selfishness and hatred which uh, starves people, which doesn't uh, uh, use the goods that we have in our rich countries for the just uh, you know, treatment of everybody in the world. And that could all be remedied if we manage to get things right. So the problem for me is one of why are people so greedy and and uh, selfish. And you addressed egoistic. this in one of your books, didn't you? Why is religion dangerous? And Yes, the book wasn't why is religion dangerous, it was just is religion dangerous. Oh, it's countering, it was countering Yes, something. it was trying to say it's not religion that's dangerous, it is greed and hatred. And uh, so that's what the danger is. And yeah. religion, I think, starts from there with that question. And for me, it certainly does. And it says, well, how can we, how can you put that right? And for me, you put it right in yourself first. Or you yeah. try to deal with it in yourself. So how can I be a bit less greedy, a little, a little bit less indifferent to other people? Yeah. Uh, and I do think that's an important point. It's no use complaining about injustice in the world if you yourself aren't doing much about it. Now, one of the things we're going to do in this series of discussions uh, is engage with philosophy and theology and history of science and religion and the interplay between the two. Um, and I suppose it goes under this sort of broad umbrella term, Christian apologetics. What do you understand by that term? Right. Well, it, um, I don't like the word apologetics much because it sounds as though you're making an apology, as though you're a bit apologetic about what you're thinking. Yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, traditionally, it doesn't mean that. It means giving a reason for the faith that you have. So it's asking the question, is belief in God, is belief in Christ as the revelation of God, are these reasonable things to believe? Are there good reasons for it? Mm. And apologetics is trying to provide those good reasons, say so there are good reasons, and I've certainly always been interested in that. I don't think um, your ultimate life commitments are based just on reason, but I do think they have to be reasonable. They, they can't be stupid, they can't be blind. Yeah. And so some of us, I think, have a job of trying to show what reasons there are to reason. support your life commitment. And I think faith, that word faith, just means a life commitment. Well, we're going to unpack that in our discussions. Right. Okay. Now, one of the last things that uh, I want to ask you is that you said to me, I think it was about a year ago, we were chatting, and you said that the, the Oxford debate is the God debate, or the God debate is the Oxford debate. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I don't want to say Oxford is the hub of the universe. I don't believe that at all. But it, it is true that Richard Dawkins and Peter Atkins and so on are well-known Oxford figures, and they have been very uh, publicly known for their atheistic stance. And then, of course, there are lots of um, people like the three of us in this programme who uh, have opposed that. So there's a debate certainly going on in Oxford which epitomises, mm. I think, that uh, question. Um, are there reasons for Christian faith and for faith in God? And that's a very important debate, and so that's what we're trying to look into. Well, Keith, I look forward to it, and thank you very much. Okay. Professor John Lennox, mathematician at Oxford, teaching there in the university at Green Templeton College. Uh, your book, recent book, which I really enjoyed, uh, God's Undertaker, Has Science Killed God? I found it remarkably lucid and logical and clear. Do you think your mathematical background helped you to write in that way? Well, I very much hope so, and I'm glad you found it clear and logical. I think that's one of the things that appealed to me about mathematics when I came across it at school, particularly Euclidean geometry. You start mm. off with the axioms, and you use uh, rigorous logic to get to the conclusion. And it helps you to learn the difference between a hypothesis and a conclusion and an argument and so mm. on. Now, of course, you can't reproduce that in the area, the intersection between theology, science and philosophy, which I'm concerned with in that book. But nonetheless, I think that a training in mathematics does help a great deal.
Now you mentioned school, and your accent clearly betrays that you're not an Oxford man by upbringing. What's your route to bring you to Oxford in your academic career? My roots are in Northern Ireland, and I grew up there. My parents were very unusual people. They were Christian without being sectarian, and they allowed me to think. And they encouraged me to think in every conceivable direction. And actually, I wanted to be an engineer and a linguist. But the school headmaster thought I might have a chance of getting into Cambridge if I concentrated on mathematics. So that's how I chose mathematics. And I ended up at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, doing my degree and then my doctorate there. From there, I went to the University of Wales and was there for around 25 years, three of which I spent abroad in the German-speaking world. And then the last 15 years, I've been working in the University of Oxford. And at Green Templeton College, that deals mainly with older graduates, doesn't it? Well, Green Templeton yeah. College is one of the graduate colleges of yeah. the university. It's a wonderful that's right. Radcliffe Observatory. That's right, that's right. Place. Yes. Now, teaching mathematics and having an interest in theology, if you look through the pages of history, there's so many who, mathematicians who have been keen on theology or had a religious faith this correlation, does that strike you as odd? Well, I would like to think that there are two sides to it, you know. Wasn't it Bacon who talked about mm. God's two books, the book mm. of his word and the book of nature? Mm. And it seems to me there's real harmony between the two. And those early pioneers, they didn't see any contradiction between their mathematics and their science and their theology. In fact, it was that belief in God that motivated them, the idea that God had, uh, as Galileo put it, didn't he, had written uh, the movements of the universe in the language of mathematics and that we kind of think his thoughts after him. Hence the correlation. I'm thinking about people like Pascal that's, and that's Newton, right. etc. Right. Now what animates you, because I know it's not merely mathematics you teach, but you have this keen interest in philosophy of science and religion? I think it goes back to my background in a way. Um, when I arrived in Cambridge, one of the first questions I was asked, I remember it so well, the first week at college was this. Somebody said to me, do you believe in God? And then they said, oh, sorry, you're Irish, I forgot. Everybody believes in God over there and they fight about it. Now, I'd heard that question before, mm. but I thought this time, you know, you've got to have a, an intellectual answer. Here you are studying a so-called high-powered academic subject at one of the best universities in the world. How do you know that your faith in God is not just Irish genetics, inherited mm. from your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, all of whom were Christians? So what I decided to do was to get to know people who did not share my worldview, and I've been doing it ever since. And that's what's interested me, because mm. philosophy goes into the ultimate questions, metaphysics, mm. the big questions, what is ultimate reality, how do we know anything, what happens after death and so on and so forth. And so it was having an intellectual grasp of those. Now, I was very fortunate. My father allowed me to read widely and I came across C.S. Lewis very young. And then I went to listen to him at Cambridge giving his last lectures. Mm. And he really inspired me as someone coming from the humanities, which I loved anyway but who really could think. And he opened up a whole world that lay behind or beyond science. And I could see that this would be enormously helpful to me in getting to grips with the articulation of the Christian faith in terms that people could understand. Now, now John, you've had to articulate that because you've been engaged in several very high profile debates. I'm thinking both sides of the Atlantic and elsewhere with uh, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Michael Shermer. That's right. Now, those debates, were they generously conducted or were they generating more heat than light? Oh, I certainly don't think they generated more heat than light. I've been very encouraged by the response to them. Mm. After all, I, I think if you ask about motivation, why does one do such a thing? What I felt was there's been a lot of media coverage given to the so-called new atheist position. And I felt, well, at least let's have an open and honest and respectful debate. Mm -hmm. Let's get the ideas out into the public space and let the public judge. So that's the spirit I uh, have in going into it. It's not to score points on the evening. Mm -hmm. It's, look, let's put our ware out. Let's talk about truth and what we understand truth to be and let the audience judge.
and I feel that that was achieved to a certain extent. Well, John, I'm looking forward to opening up this discussion further in our sessions and our uh, times together and exploring many of these issues. Well, but thank you now, very much for inviting you. me. It's lovely to talk to you. Thank you, John. Hello, my name is Chris Jervis. I'm a chaplain and I teach theology, philosophy, religious studies and critical thinking here at Canford School. And I've invited three guests to join me for a series of discussions based loosely around the themes of philosophy, science and religion. The big questions of God, God's existence and how we relate these themes of philosophy, science and faith. I want to introduce our guests first before we start with the first of our series of discussions. Firstly, Professor John Lennox, Fellow of Mathematics and the Philosophy of Science at Green Templeton College in Oxford, recently written God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? and engaged in frequent debates with some of those who are representative of the new atheism, people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchin, etc. Also joining us, Professor Keith Ward. Keith has served for many years in academia as a well, professional philosopher, but uh, Regis Professor Emeritus for Christ Church in Oxford, written numerous books, uh, many of which have been enjoyed by students and the layman alike. Also a fellow of the British Academy. And thirdly, the third guest today, Professor Alastair McGrath, Professor of Theology at Oxford for many, many years, still retains a senior fellowship there and is currently serving as a Professor of Theology at London. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us here at Camford. We're going to have a series of discussions, all three of you eminent professors in different disciplines, all three of you people espouse the Christian faith, hold a Christian faith. So we have that in common, but I dare say at many points we'll disagree or have different takes on certain subjects, but I'm glad you've been able to join us here. And the first thing I want us to pursue is this whole idea of faith and knowledge and belief and how we know things to be true and with what degree of confidence we can hold those things to be true. I'm going to start with you, John, if I may. We've been told by a number of people that faith is merely a delusion. Um, it's a weakness, an illness almost. Is that how you see faith? Well, it depends on what the faith is put in. I think the first question that needs to be addressed is the nature of faith because there's a very widespread impression been put around by Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens in particular that faith is believing where there isn't any, any evidence. In fact, it's believing where you know there isn't any evidence. And therefore, faith is a peculiarly religious phenomenon and has nothing to do with science. Now, I disagree with that very severely because, firstly, faith the word is related to the Latin fides, which means trust and loyalty. And if you look up even the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll find that faith uh, has in its content the notion of trust and loyalty of a commitment based in evidence. So the first thing I would like to say is that Richard Dawkins' definition of faith is what we'd normally call blind faith. And that, of course, is a delusion and can be dangerous faith not based on evidence but faith in the normal sense of the word in which most people use it is in my estimation a commitment based on evidence after all we all lost faith in the banking system and they're finding it very difficult to recover our trust our faith because they have to produce evidence 
on which to base it. So that would be the first point. And there's another point which we can perhaps make later. And that is that faith, in that sense, is very much involved in science itself. We'll come back to that. Uh, Alistair, can I come to you? Blind faith, do you recognise that definition? Well, I recognise it, but it's clearly only one possibility of many. Mm. And certainly as someone who used to be very active in the sciences, the point I'd want to make is that all scientists are looking at evidence and they're asking what is the best way of making sense of it. And clearly the development of scientific theories is saying in our judgment, as a matter of faith, this is the best way of making sense of this. Now that judgment may change over time as new evidence becomes available, but in effect it's tr saying, look, we need to ask what is the best big picture that makes sense of this evidence? And clearly you have to make leaps of faith at a certain point. For example, if you're involved in this great debate about whether there is a universe or a multiverse, whatever position you take in that debate really is a matter of faith. Faith is about judgments based on evidence. And we, we all do that every day of the week. Blind faith is just saying, I believe what I like, I don't care what the evidence says. But when you're like us and are really committed to the evidence, you still find there are points at which the evidence does not force you to a conclusion, but it points to a conclusion. And in following through, really, you're making that judgment as a matter of faith. It's not a problem. But surely, if Dawkins and others are actually saying this, it, presumably they are coming across advocates of blind faith. I, I mean, have... Well, there are advocates of blind faith, and some of them, I'm sure, are religious. They say, you know, trust this, don't think about it. I have to say, I find some of that in the New Atheism. Trust us on this, don't think about it. You know, we're right, don't think about this. I think it's very important to make the point that we need to be critical here to ask what is the evidence for this. That's why I'm a Christian, I used to be an atheist. When I began to think critically, I found the evidence led me to belief in God. Well, Keith, I mean, your whole life has been geared to academic thinking. You're a professional philosopher by background. Um, let's just stay with this issue of faith. Is it delusory? Is it blind? Or do you concur with these guys that it's actually based on evidence? Well, yes. I mean, I think the best uh, definition of faith I know comes from the Danish philosopher Kierkegaard, who said that uh, faith is a passionate commitment made in objective uncertainty. Uh, lots of things in oh, life. I'll unpack that one for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of things in life where you can't come to a, an absolutely certain conclusion. You might be wrong, but you weigh things up and, and, and see what uh, seems the most adequate view to you. And then you, if it's good, if it's something which is morally challenging, you may have to passionately commit yourself to that. Let me give a very simple example. Suppose mm. you take a moral uh, case like, um, let's take a controversial one, is, is abortion uh, wrong? Well, you can look at all the evidence about that. You can look at everything that everybody knows uh, about embryos and so on. You can get that, and it still doesn't force you to a particular conclusion. So you've got to make a passionate commitment. You've got to commit yourself. It's life and death, literally. Mm. And, but you've got to make that commitment. It's very decisive in one way. But it's, it really is, if we're honest about questions like that, it's objectively uncertain in the sense that different, equally intelligent people come to different views on it. And even though, of course, I think my view is right, <laughs> I've got to admit that in other intelligent people disagree. So it's not, there's not evidence that compels you. Right? So, so saying it's not permissible, to have, it's not morally right to have abortion, that, that, it, that is not compelled by the evidence. The evidence is relevant. You've got to take it into account. Mm. But you've got to make that decisive commitment. And for me, um, matters of personal experience, things like getting married or living with somebody or uh, getting a job, deciding what to do with your life, these are huge practical commitments. You have to make them. You have to make them in objective uncertainty, but you have to look at all the facts and weigh them up yourself as well. Is, is there a sense there, Keith, that you're making the difference between, in a way, evidence and proof? As a mathematician, yeah. people often use the word proof, but in mathematics, and that's really where the idea of proof in its full sense occurs, you don't get that even in the natural sciences or in ordinary life. You can't speak of proof in the absolute logical sense based on axioms following a certain logic to a conclusion. What you're saying is there are pointers, there are indicators, there's evidence which is strong enough to base a commitment on. And I think it's important possibly to bring in here the fact that from the perspective of the Christian faith, 
the kind of faith that is demanded there is very clearly evidence-based because the early Christian message was a preaching of the resurrection. That was offered as an objective historical fact on which faith could be based. It wasn't the other way around. In other words, the early disciples' faith didn't create the evidence as some kind of fantasy in their mind. No, their faith was a response to the evidence of the incarnation, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So I think it's important to to realize that there are differences. And of course, each religion must speak for itself here. But it seems to me that Christianity has committed itself to being based on historical evidence. And as Keith points out very importantly, evidence of personal experience. You mentioned your mathematics background, and I want to come on to the various disciplines that you come from in a minute, but I just want to pick up something Keith said and probably throw it back to all three of you. Um, you. You gave the example of abortion. You gather all the information, but you make that passionate commitment. You have to believe and go with it. Is there a danger that what you're saying or implying is, well, what you believe is true? No. Well, I mean, of course... Wait a minute, let's get this straight. I mean, if you believe something, you think it's true. I mean, obviously you do. Uh, but it doesn't make it true. Right. And I think you can, uh, in philosophy, you sometimes call it being a fallibilist. That is to say, you admit you could be wrong, but you honestly think you're right. Can I give another example yeah. for that? Suppose you ask the question, am I, as a human being, a free, responsible agent? Can I, can I do things freely so I could have done something different and I'm responsible, I'm guilty or I'm perhaps praiseworthy for doing it? Am I? Now, OK, that's a question of fact. I believe I am free. <laughs> I think I am morally responsible. I think I am. I believe I'm right. But... I will admit that I can see no way um, of proving. And proof is, as you quite rightly said, it's not, it's not a question of proof. And if I say, is there overwhelming evidence? Well, you know, all philosophers know all the evidence, and philosophers disagree. So it's a strange sense of evidence here. It doesn't, you, you can't get any more. You've got all the evidence you can, and you've still got to make a decision. And uh, you've got to believe that, and you can commit your life to that. And that, So it is principle. It's not blind. You don't say, oh, I just, I'm just free, I don't care what you, yeah. you... You look at all the arguments carefully, and at the end you say, well, there are good arguments on both sides, but it seems to me... And this is what philosophy is all about. You think, well, which are the ones that I find convincing? And you've got to admit an element of subjective choice there. You've got to admit that. You believe what you think is true but you realise that you're having to make that decision. And it's far from blind. It's, it's really right. agonising decision sometimes. I find one of the best analogies for this, and it builds on what you're saying, Keith, is a human relationship, say, of marriage. If I think of my relationship with my wife, well, when I first met her, I took in evidence about her through my eyes and then through my ears, and then I get to know her. And there builds up a multi-level package, so to speak, of evidence, but that's not the same as the commitment. I make the commitment on the basis of all the evidence. I don't know everything, mm. but it's sufficient to make a commitment. And we don't use the word proof there at all, but I'd stake my life on it. In other words, we're not suggesting that because we cannot use the word proof, this is not evidence that's big enough to stake your life on, just as in a human relationship, say, of marriage. And I think the important thing about that is that, and again it focuses on the point Keith has made, that in talking about God, we've got to remember that we're not relating with a proposition merely. We're relating to a person. And therefore all those multiplicities of levels of evidence that are personal come into play as well as the intellectual. It's not either or, it's both and. I think that's very important. I think we could take this a stage further because faith isn't just believing that a certain situation is right. Mm. It's much more about commitment, about mm. trusting and saying, I believe I can act on the basis of these assumptions. And in the case of Christianity, it's not simply believing that there is a God. It is believing that there is a God who may be trusted, that one can entrust oneself to this God. So it's actually a, more of a relational or almost existential idea. Here something that I believe to be right, but believing it to be right means I can act in certain ways, that I can commit my life to this and live this out satisfactorily. So I think there's a, there's a very deep level to it, which very often is just not adequately represented by critics of faith who seem to think it's simply an extra item of, of mental furniture that makes no difference to the way you behave. If this is right, it changes everything. Faith 
you don't recognise or wouldn't concur with this notion of blind faith and you've helped us in that respect. I just want us to look at knowledge. Now, you operate in different disciplines and therefore, presumably, you use different tools to acquire knowledge or what you deem to be knowledge. We've already got evidence of this already because of the proof nature that comes through mathematics, but I dare say very different tools are being used in philosophy and in biology and theology. So let's just take very succinctly, if I may ask, John and then Alastair and then Keith, uh, taking from mathematics, how do you acquire knowledge, something you're confident to be true? Well, in my own discipline, which is abstract algebra, what I'm studying mm. is an axiomatic mm. system where you agree to the basic axioms. You also agree... So you hold the basic truths of the axioms to well, be true? Well, these are basic yeah. assumptions. Yeah. The question of truth is another matter. Okay, right. I would need to ask you, do you then. mean true in the sense that they cohere with some reality okay, outside? That, that we'll accept the basic assumptions then. And, the basic yeah. assumptions. And what you then try to do is to understand and grasp all the consequences of those assumptions. Now, the reason you're studying the system in the first place is because it has apparently been found at some level or other useful in getting a model of what you understand the real world to be. But in my own discipline, the actual axiomatic system becomes of such interest in itself that what you're trying to understand are the consequences and ramifications and connections and implications of, of those axioms without any reference to any concept of does it fit the external world? Okay. So it'll be very different from some of the things these men well, do. I want to ask Alistair about biology, because you have a doctorate in biology, molecular biology, before you became a theologian. The tools you use to acquire you, uh, knowledge in the area of biological research? Well, clearly the primary tool is experimental observation. You're, you're trying to amass a series of observations. And in many ways, what you're trying to do then is to say, well, what, what theory does this seem to lead us towards? What is the, the best big picture which seems to make sense of this? And something that we're just very familiar with from other areas of life, for example, a court trial. You have all the, the evidence being laid before you, mm -hmm. but you're still being asked what happened. And, and in many ways, it's the same idea. Lay out all the observations, all the evidence. What is the conclusion that this points us towards? Recognising that actually there may be several possible outcomes and you may not actually be able to distinguish between them. That's why in science the idea of a crucial experiment is so important. In many ways a crucial experiment is what allows you to say it's this and not that. But actually crucial experiments are very very difficult to design and that's why in science there is very often uncertainty about what the best way of interpreting experimental observation is. And of course subsequent evidence may yield an amended understanding. Or oh, amended exactly. View, yeah. and, and Richard Dawkins yeah. gives a very good example of this. He talks about Darwin's theory of evolution. And he makes the point entirely rightly that a century from now we may have to abandon Darwin or modify him radically simply because theoretical advance has taken yeah. place and more observation has happened as well. Now, Keith, can you speak for theology and philosophy? Well, philosophy uh, yeah. is a very odd subject, and a very interesting one. But the most obvious thing about philosophy is that people are never going to agree. I mean, and that's a very important thing to say, because yes. it isn't the, f the case that everybody's really agreed about something like the common sense world, we all agree about that. It's not true. In philosophy, you ask the question, how do I know that this is reality? I mean, is there a difference between reality and what appears to me? And then what's really there when I'm not observing it? Right? Questions like that. And the ultimate philosophical questions, I think, belong to metaphysics, which, which is the qu simple question, really, what exists? What sorts of things exist? And the big division in philosophy has been throughout the whole history of philosophy, East and West, is uh, are the ultimate things that exist lumps of matter, whatever that might be, things with mass and position and velocity in space, is that what everything's made of and we're just complicated lumps of it? Or is the ultimate reality more like mind, more like consciousness, more like intelligence? Uh, that's a real question and that's a philosophical question. So what philosophers do is explore these possibilities and, as in mathematics a bit, draw out their implications. What would it be like if this were true? So it's a, it's a much more speculative discipline, but it's one which gets to the heart of the issue in religion, really. Whether or not you're religious, uh, philosophers, some believe in God, some don't. But all good philosophers would say it's a really serious question, and um, 
it's well worth asking with all the critical rigour you can manage. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. I mean, we've started the ball rolling. We're looking at faith, we're looking at knowledge. We've seen that faith is not merely blind faith or delusional. It's evidence-based. That's how we understand it. That underpins Christian faith. And clearly, the way we arrive at knowledge in different disciplines will vary. Some will help be held very firmly, some less so, more tentatively. But the tools we use are particular to the various disciplines. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Hello, uh, my name is Chris Jervis and I have with me three guests, professors from Oxford, John Lennox, Keith Ward, Alastair McGrath, and we're discussing issues of philosophy, science and faith, religious faith. And in the first uh, discussion we held, we looked at issues of how we understand and define faith and how we arrive at a body of knowledge in our various disciplines, mathematics, philosophy, uh, biology and theology. We're going to move it on now to look specifically at the interface between science and faith and how the two relate. And Alistair, if I may start with you, historically much of the scientific enterprise has been based on a theistic, a God worldview. Um, is that accurate as a historical perspective and why might that be so? Well, there's no doubt that what we sometimes call the scientific revolution began in Western Europe, which of course was a Christian context. And I think that the real issue is to try and work out what in the Christian faith might in some way feed into that. And clearly ideas like God creating the world in an ordered way, and God creating us in a way which in some way allows us to access the rationality of the universe. Now that could be a very important background to the whole scientific enterprise. And so for me, looking at the um, emergence of the natural sciences, I see a synergy between the Christian way of looking at things and the scientific method. I wouldn't want to go so far as to say science is caused by Christianity, but there is no doubt there is a very positive interaction, which I think will come as news to those who have this idea that science and Christianity are locked into some kind of war. I mean, that's just, I think, very, very difficult to defend indeed. For me, there may be tensions at times, but at times there's this very powerful synergy which takes us in some very interesting directions. By this, the synergy, are you saying that within the Christian worldview there's a natural seedbed for scientific enterprise? Well, absolutely. To, yeah. I mean, the Christian vision is that God creates an orderly world <laughs> and us in such a way that we can grasp this. It's, it's what you find in Kepler, for example, this idea that the, the world is written in the language of mathematics and we are able to access this. So there's a very powerful intellectual framework that undergirds the scientific method here. So I suppose what people are doing is we're engaged in the scientific enterprise. We, you've heard of the old phrase, we're thinking God's thoughts after him. Mm. Do you recognise that, John? I do indeed. I think C.S. Lewis put it very well, summarising the thought of Alfred North Whitehead when he said men, unfortunately it was just men then, men became scientific. Why? Because they expected law in nature and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. And for me this is enormously important that far from belief in God hindering science, as is often argued today, it was arguably, with the comments and caveats that Alistair's mentioned, the motor that drove the rise of science. And it's very interesting that to me, that the presumption of God is very closely allied with the notion that the universe is rationally intelligible. And I think it's very helpful to analyse that from the atheistic perspective. What reason has an atheist, for instance, to believe that the universe is rationally intelligible? Because what we're really talking about here is a basic article of faith that all scientists share. Mm. 
whether they believe in God or not, they believe in a rationally intelligible universe. Otherwise, you'd never be science. Let me just say that. Rationally intelligible. We're talking about the fact that there's connectedness. That is accessible it. to a yeah. certain extent to the human mind. So this is what Einstein, when he said the mystery of the universe is its comprehensibility. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe, Einstein said, is that it's comprehensible. And one of my favourite articles was written by the Nobel Prize winner Eugene Vigner in 1961 where he talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. How is it that a mathematician thinking in her head in here can get a mathematical apparatus that seems to describe fairly accurately the universe out there? And he said that's a very unreasonable thing to expect, which is what Einstein is saying. I would say it's only unreasonable if you assume atheism. In other words, atheism is telling me that the human mind is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. Then it would be very surprising if that apparatus gives me anything approximating to truth. But what the Christian faith says, the reason that the universe out there is in part accessible to the human mind in here is that both have ultimately the same author, God. As Keith, I suppose what we're doing here in these two responses, we're bridging into philosophy, i.e. the notion that there is this synergy between the scientific world and a faith-based system. Does that make sense to a philosopher? Yes. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I don't think you can do philosophy properly without knowing about science or without being fascinated by it, because that tells you what the world is like as far as we can understand it. And, and a key question there is, uh, is it just a chaos? I mean, there have been philosophers. Uh, David Hume, with at least part of his philosophy, said it's just one damn thing after another. You know, there's no reason why mm. anything should uh, obey any laws of nature at all. There's no reason behind the universe. It's just, you know, completely, as we'd say, contingent. That is, say, anything might happen. Right? Mm. And the fact is, uh, the world's not like that. We do. We make this faith assumption. I think uh, David Hume the greatest Scottish philosopher, most people think, uh, said uh, that actually we do make faith assumptions, basically, that there is an objective universe, that it does have laws of nature, that it is intelligible, that mathematics will apply to it. Uh, and these are amazing things to say. And I think, uh, from my point of view, that would lead a lot of philosophers, including me, uh, say this is not just a, an empiricist universe. It's not a universe where you just have a lot of sense experiences one after the other and nothing connects them together. Mm. It's a deeply mathematical, structured uh, universe. It looks, when you read the Gospel of John, and it says in the beginning was the intellect, the, the logos, the mind of God, you think, that just fits what the universe is like. And that's one of the things that led me to become a Christian. I thought, well, you know, yeah. as a philosopher, it looks like we've, we've got a rational universe. What could be the basis for that? It is not one damn thing after another. As Alistair says, it gives a big picture that makes coherent sense. And that is enormously important. And I think it's enormously it, improbable. Unless you've got an explanation. Yes, and, it, yes. and the theistic explanation makes, yeah. that makes, makes that sense yeah. and it's the yeah. framework in which science rose. And I fear sometimes, coming back to the point Alistair made at the beginning, that we lose this perspective on history and people get the impression that no respectable person could possibly believe in God. We forget the motors that drove science. I'll never forget... Uh, giving what turned out to be the first lecture on the relationship between Christianity and science in 75 years in Russia, in the University of Novosibirsk. And I started by talking about Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and so on, Clark Maxwell, Babbage, and their commitment in various senses to God. And as I was lecturing on this, I could see that some senior members of the audience were growing very angry indeed, and I got nervous because there were 500 of them. It was the first time, and I stopped, and I said, what's wrong? And they said, why were we never told that these scientists believe in God? And I just said, can't you guess? The point being that there is a danger of spreading a myth around. Firstly, that theism is, so to speak, anti-scientific, and secondly, that science never had any contribution from the theistic worldview. That's a complete myth, mm. as Alistair said. Well, Alice, let me take you back to your first introduction or comment on this theme. Um, give us some history, some examples. You just mentioned various characters, Galileo, Kepler, etc. 
um, some examples or, if you like, milestones in the history of science which have been marked by men of faith. Well, John's uh, given us some very good examples. I mean, Kepler is a very good person to start with. I mean, Kepler took the view that the regularities in the universe reflected a corresponding regularity in the mind of the one who designed the universe, and therefore that, that, that we could kind of way, think God's thoughts after him. And so for Kepler, as for so many scientists of that age, um, there was a very powerful motivation for science. First of all, it was about discovering more about the world. But secondly, it was, if you like, thinking God's thoughts after him. It was about how should I put it, rediscovering the fundamental harmony of the universe, about mm -hmm. reconnecting with a much bigger picture, not just the universe as an abstract entity, but about something that was grounded in the nature and will of God. And if you like it, it kind of way repositions us in the bigger scheme of things. And that seems to me to be extremely important because one of the concerns many scientists have these days is that science is disconnected from the bigger questions of life. That's a recent development. It wasn't always like that. Again, if we look at Newton, just to give you one more example, I mean, Newton had this very deep sense of the fundamental harmony of the universe. And he, towards the end of his life, he, he said some words I, I keep coming back to. He says, I have been like a, a young boy playing along the shore, occasionally finding a pebble or a shell, which are more beautiful than others, whilst beyond me, the ocean of truth lay undiscovered. In other words, he was playing around on the shore and there were massive depths remaining undiscovered. And I think that's what science is really like. It's about appreciating the pebbles and the shells, but at the same time realizing there's something much deeper there and we need to go into that. We will never be intellectually satisfied mm -hmm. until we start going deeper. Now, the comment you just made, in one sense, reminds me of something linked to our first theme that we discussed to do with faith and knowledge. Is there a, a body of knowledge out there to be discovered such that when we advance through scientific discoveries or whatever, we push back, push back ignorance and that there's that body to be discovered? Is that the way scientists consider matters? Keith? Did... Uh, well, again... Uh, if you're looking at philosophy, well, no two philosophers agree, so you're going to get, uh, you know, it's very important to say yeah, disagreement yeah. is of, of the essence, yeah. it's not an agreed view. Uh, and I suppose people sometimes called relativists would say, um, or postmodernists sometimes they might be called, there's no truth out there. I strongly disagree with that. I, I think most philosophers uh, would disagree with it, not all, uh, because uh, I think it's very important to say there is a truth to be found, uh, and it's very important to search for that truth. And if I have a scientist who says, I've got the whole truth and it all has to fit into this pattern, well, that's going to be wrong as well. I mean, the truth's got to include every aspect of human existence and experience. So that it's very important to say there is a truth, we need to find it, but I personally think it's very important to say, I don't have the whole truth myself. Mm -hmm. I speak from a particular perspective, and uh, you know, I've learned lots of things, and I, I do believe uh, that I put it in theistic terms, there is a God to be found, but I don't understand God fully, and there's a, a lot to be learned. So that, uh, you don't have to be postmodern mm -hmm. about this. You say there is a truth, but I don't have the whole thing. My views are fallible, but I'm doing the best I can. And if you take the whole of human experience into account, then belief in God or something very like God, belief in transcendent goodness and beauty and intelligibility, that's part of the human quest for truth. I was asked recently, it's a personal anecdote, um, what my favourite biblical verse was, and I recounted uh, Paul's letter to Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 12. Now we know in part, then we shall know fully, even as we're fully known. Because I think part of our nature is to be inquisitive, to know things, mm -hmm. and just to remain inquisitive all our days and recognise we won't fully know everything and encompass all truth, etc. So that, that note of humility, I think, mm -hmm. is so important. That might be well part of the image of God. Yeah. I think Keith has hit on something very important. He mentioned postmodernism and so on. That's one of the few things I share in common with Richard Dawkins. We're not postmodern. Very few scientists mm. are. Mm. And indeed, the whole postmodernist notion of there isn't truth is self-defeating because they're claiming as truth that there isn't any truth. So there's something fundamentally uh, self-defeating there. But... I, I think the idea of the ocean of undiscovered truth is a very good one. There is truth out there. We never completely grasp it. But we're getting there. We're getting closer. Einstein is a better approximation than Newton, for instance, is a better approximation than Ptolemy. That tends to be, that 
we often call it critical realism, the belief of many scientists. Now, of course, as a mathematician, and that may have been hinted at the way you phrased mm. the question, one tends to be asked the question, is mathematics discovered or is it invented? Well, being an Irishman, I want to have it both ways. I think that both things are true, that there is a basic rationality to the universe that's been built into it by God, so that Newton laws are not arbitrary, for example. They are grasping at something. But I do believe that we are created in the image of God and we're given creativity so that we can invent mathematics as well as discover it. Mm. Now, I know this is a very big discussion. I'd probably be shouted down by my philosophical colleagues. But nonetheless, I think there may be two things rather than one. Well, I want to return to that later in our discussions. But you also hinted at something there. You talked about this vast ocean of knowledge. Yes. Uh, and, of course, the accusation is made by some that uh, the religious person, seeing this vast body of knowledge, throws their hands up and says, we can't possibly do anything, let's just believe. And I'm thinking particularly um, of one of your colleagues at Oxford, uh, Professor Peter Atkins, who, in a tape I watched recently, spoke about religious people being intellectually lazy, uh, etc., uh, because they wouldn't engage. And I suppose what I'm doing here is I'm hinting at this conflict notion, and I want us to move on to why is it that this idea has arisen that philo sorry, religion and science are in conflict? Alistair, any... Well, I was taught physical chemistry by Peter Atkins at Oxford many years ago, right. so I, I actually remember it as being a very engaging lecture with a wonderful facility for bold over statements which were fascinating mm. in lectures and I think <laughs> what you've given us is one of those. I mean, into the, I, I used to be intellectually lazy when I was an atheist. It was just obvious to me because I, I was studying sciences that, you know, science disproved God. I was 16 at the time and of course I believed these things with the ferocity and confidence of a 16 year old. Mm. I think when I came to Oxford I, I really began to rethink things and very, my paradox really is that it was by using my critical faculties that I moved away from atheism and therefore if I I was intellectually lazy, I just stayed an atheist. I think I, what, what I want to say is that you just can't... Sorry, sorry, it must be said that not all atheists are intellectually no, lazy. Of course they're not. But, but, of course yes, they're not. But I mean, what what I'm trying yes, to make yes. is that intellectual laziness basically means we don't think about yeah. things. And I'm just trying to make the point that really we can't have this kind of stuff. That in many ways, the real issue is to, to say that uh, it is when you begin to engage with things that very new horizons open up. And for me, this opened my eyes to the Christian way of thinking. And so, for me, it was a very very important discovery. So far from being intellectually lazy. But we, we have got this view abroad, haven't we, that science and religion are in conflict. It's one of those models that's put abroad, it's either advocated or just presumed. Keith, any ideas where this has arisen? Well, I mean, I think there are lots of intellectual conflicts. I mean, as I keep saying, philosophers are always conflicting with yeah. each other, and there are those debates. There are as many conflicts within science as there are between science and religion, and the truth is it's not a conflict between science and religion. I mean, after all, how many different religions are there in the world? Even within Christianity, you can be everything from an Eastern Orthodox uh, Catholic uh, Christian to a Quaker. <laughs> yeah. And so you've got to look at what is the conflict between, and I suppose there are specific examples I mean, the most obvious one at the moment is um, neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory is in conflict with a literal interpretation of the book of Genesis. So th there is an argument that's there, yeah. but that's not an argument between science and religion. It's an argument between two different interpretations of Genesis, which is an internal religious dispute, uh, and it's an argument in science about whether neo-Darwinianism is in fact an adequate evolutionary theory, which is not at all accepted by everybody, and many biologists hate each other with a, a huge... Uh, you know, distaste for holding... So the argument is not, I would say, between science and religion. It's between particular scientific views uh, and particular religious views which often argue with each but other as well as between the two disciplines. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.
continue our discussion on the relationship between science and religion. It seems to me, in one sense, it's very easy to see that the conflict metaphor, that science is essentially antagonistic to religion, is false. Take, for example, the Human Genome Project. Its first director was Jim Watson, Nobel Prize winner, an outspoken atheist. Its second director was Francis Collins, a Christian. Their science impeccable, so it's not science that divides them. But those two people show us where the real conflict is. It's not between science and religion so much as it is between two worldviews. The worldview, and Keith has explained the two earlier in an earlier program, the worldview of materialism or naturalism on one side and theism on the other. And I like to put it this way, the conflict is a worldview conflict. There are scientists on both sides. Well, I want to come back to worldviews in a subsequent uh, discussion, but uh, let me just trace this. We, we've alluded to conflicts and how this notion of the conflict model has arisen. Um, we clearly trace certain characters in the history. We think of Galileo in the church. We think of Wilberforce and Huxley. Um, just rerun re these. Is that science versus faith? Well, very often, if we look at this very superficially, <laughs> And I'm afraid there are those who do look at this very superficially. I mean, Galileo is science versus religion. Until you start doing the scholarship. And when you start doing the scholarship, it becomes much more significant. It's not science versus religion. It's actually factionalization within the church, with Galileo initially being aligned with one faction, then falling out of favor of that faction, being aligned with another. And it's all about power play. And in many ways, we're talking about not so much science and religion as the scientific community versus quite a complex ecclesiastical community with political factors beginning to come involved. So I think there's a need to really be historically very rigorous about this. And very often what presents itself as science and religion is much more complex. Mm. I think that needs to be said very, very clearly. For example, uh, we could look at others as well, but the same principle very often emerges. It looks like this on the surface, but if you go deeper, much more complex, the real issues very often are power, professionalism and privilege. Uh, I think another, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. no. But I was just going to add a little mm. bit to that. For, uh, that uh, a lot of the Galileo uh, controversy was about uh, the establishment in science of the day versus the radical new uh, mm. methods of observational science. And it was about whether Aristotle was right uh, mm. in his scientific views, and, or whether Galileo and this new stuff was right, so that Aristotle was wrong about the stars being beautiful, crystalline things that had no impurities, etc. So there was a huge philosophical debate going on, and it's the sort of thing you might get today if you have established fellows of the Royal Society arguing against some young upstart who's got a new theory. And it's, a, it's a bit like that, so that's another aspect, mm. too, of the same thing that Alistair's talking about. So there's an element of science versus science, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, I find the Galileo incident absolutely intriguing because Galileo is sometimes uh, pictured as a, an atheist who challenged the religious establishment, which is nonsense. Galileo believed in scripture when he started and he believed in scripture when he finished. And the irony of the Galileo situation to my mind is here's a man who believed in scripture challenging what? Not simply the church, but the reigning scientific paradigm of Aristotelianism. And the fascinating thing about it is the church had bought into that paradigm. So Galileo was first attacked by the philosophers, not the church. The church then piled in. And the irony was they'd all absorbed the same paradigm, which is perhaps a little warning to us that sometimes the church can hitch itself too rapidly to a scientific paradigm that could, as Alistair said earlier, change. And we know that Galileo, the believer in God, turned out to be right. Well, let's run the clock forward a bit. We won't delay on it too long, uh, dwell on it too long, but Wilberforce, Huxley, um, what was happening there? This was the well, debate at... Well, a very famous debate at Oxford yes. in 1860. When, 150 uh, years ago. Yes, that's right, when Wilberforce, who yeah. was Bishop of Oxford, uh, met Thomas Huxley, really to debate um, Darwin's Origin of Species, which had been published the year before. And uh, probably many listening to this programme will, will be aware of this uh, very famous put-down that Huxley administered to Wilberforce, saying, you know, uh, you know basically, um, you have asked me, you know, is it through my grandfather or grandmother I'm descended from an ape? And he, he then you know, really piled into Wilberforce in a very big way. I think recent historical scholarship has suggested that might be something of a historical myth. 
And when you look at the debate in more detail, I mean, there are real scientific issues there, and Wilberforce had read Darwin very closely and actually pointed out some problems that Darwin had to address in a later book. So it's not really so much science versus religion. It's much more, uh, in Wilberforce's case, that sort of scientifically informed bishop raising some interesting questions, and Huxley perhaps not performing as well in debate as he ought to have, and trying to retrospectively, can we rewrite the debate? Much more complicated than the stereotypes tell us. Because it was retrospective, wasn't it? It wasn't actually ministered as a debate. Right? Really, uh, at the time, it caused very little interest, but in, la in, in later historiography, it was yeah. signalled as a landmark, signalling, if you like, the beginning of the science-religion conflict. And isn't it true, Alistair, that I seem to remember I read the whole Wilberforce paper, and one of the fascinating things about it is this, as far as I can remember it, that far from Wilberforce adopting religious argument, that was the very thing he eschewed explicitly. He said, I'm oh, not yes. going to dissent religious argument. I want to argue on a purely scientific it basis. It is, and, and basically Darwin had to respond to that because Darwin, I think if I remember rightly, said that uh, Wilberforce's commons were uncommonly Commonly, clever. That's right. You know, that's and he right. felt the, uh, there's something wrong for God. So I've got to He's found this. the weakest points yes, exactly. in my theory. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Let's move it on. We do have a situation today, I mean, these are historic examples, but if we do have a situation today where there are a number of people who do see the conflict model as still relevant. And we must clearly think of people like Richard Dawkins who effectively say that anybody who still retains any vestiges of belief in a god really is living in cowed cuckoo land on a par with believing in tooth fairies, etc. And that science has brought him to that point and that science would push back the boundaries of ignorance, I think Ingersoll said this, and we ought to be rid of all religion. Um, Keith, let me start with you on this. Uh, is that, why have we arrived at that situation? Is that a situation held by many or any, or is it a very minority view? I think that's a very minority view, and uh, I don't think any informed philosophers uh, or philosophers of science would take that view seriously at all because it's so obviously false. In fact, a lot of work now done by uh, quantum physicists in particular, I mean, that's the sexy subject, quantum physics, of, um, which has very weird views about the universe, but um, is very sympathetic to a view that makes consciousness more important uh, than you might have thought on an old picture. Well, of course, consciousness would be something like the mind of God. Okay? Uh, and it's, it is actually quite an attractive theory. I'm, I'm not wanting to defend it particularly. I'm just saying, if you look at what quantum physicists say and write, take something like Roger Penrose, for example, whose mm. book is in front of us here. And Roger Penrose has said recently, well, at, he said, I haven't written much about consciousness in, in my books, but looking back, I think perhaps I should have. And when we develop physics a little further, we might find we have to explicitly bring consciousness into it. And that's partly because of things like you know, the collapse of the wave function upon measurement or observation. It, it, so there are good yeah. scientific reasons right, for being sceptical of a view that says we can have a view of the universe without any attention to, to a mind or a consciousness other than what happens in humans. Okay. There's a very clear statement, I think you quoted this in one of your books, uh, from Stephen Jay Gould, um, who said effectively, didn't he, that, um, you know, really science is neutral on the matter of faith, and complete the quotation from me if you can, it's something to the effect that uh, if it were not so, then... Well, science, by its legitimate methods, yes. cannot comment on the God question. Right. And Gould's absolutely right. I mean, Gould did not believe in God, but it wasn't because of science. I mean, and I think it's a, it's a recurring theme. If you go back to Thomas Huxley, the very famous speech at the dedication of the Darwin statue in the 1890s, he ended that speech with these words, and I think they are very powerful words. Science commits suicide if it adopts a creed. The point he's making is that science is a method. And if you start making it into a kind of religious or indeed an anti-religious creed, it stops being science. It becomes a dogmatic worldview. And I think there's a battle for the soul of science going on right now between those who want to hijack it with an atheist agenda and those who want to keep it as science, which is a neutral, open-ended way of making sense of the world. And I think all of us around this table want to keep it open-ended. The real problem is that there are dogmatic atheists who want to close the whole thing down and part of their approach to this is simply saying science and religion are in conflict. Well, I'm sorry, they're not. Get used to it. Because 
Stephen Jay Gould made the statement, didn't he? He said that if it were so, then half my colleagues, being atheists, half being theists, they're absolute idiots. They're not. They're very clever, intelligent men of science, some believing in God, some not. But his yeah. solution, mm. though, mm. was not satisfactory. His noma. Uh, his noma, his yeah. idea that you have science here, yeah, you have yeah, science yeah, on the yeah. one side, that's a magisterium, it's a body of teaching, yeah, you have yeah. religion on the other side, yeah. and they can happily coexist provided you keep them apart. Mm. Now that sounds very impressive, and it may be in part true. Science tends to answer different questions, the how questions and the why of function as distinct from the why of purpose that we get answered in theology and so on. But it mm. seems to me that if you read the subtext of Jay Gould, it seems to me at least that Science deals with reality, religion with everything else. That won't do either. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, in fact, it's the science-religion mm. split like that mm. is only uh, one part of, a, of the real division in our culture, and that is the one uh, between the humanities and the natural sciences. Mm. And we've never resolved that. And it's, it's a very difficult, very clear split. I mean, in schools, people will opt for the arts, the humanities, or they'll opt for the sciences. Very few people can manage both. Well, thank goodness some do. Mm. But there is that difference of techniques, different of approaches, different of subject matter. One, the humanities are dealing with human experiences, the expression of human feelings, human evaluations and goals. And the natural sciences are setting that aside and saying, let's just look at how physical particles behave in certain controllable conditions. And that split... The two cultures, as C.P. Snow mm. called it, is a very strong part of our mm. society. And the fact that religion comes uh, in as something which is opposed to science is, is really part of that wider division between some scientists, who are a bit narrow-minded in my view, not taking humanities seriously or thinking that they have any way of approaching truth. So I think that's the real question. What, I, what I wonder if in any sense uh, quantum mechanics will bridge this to some extent. I'm, I'm thinking that the classic view of science as being objective out there, empirically tested, proven, uh, demonstrable truths, and the humanities dealing with a more subjective element. But there is this subjective element coming in through the quantum mechanics, isn't it? As you said, the collapse of the wave function and the role of the observer. And it seems to me that maybe there is a way that's bringing these two hitherto separate disciplines yeah. together. I, I'd be a bit uh, reluctant to yeah. put too much stress on mm. quantum mechanics because it's at such an early stage of interpretation. I mean, the, the maths mm. is fine as far as I understand yeah. it, as far as you understand it. It works, anyway. but nobody understands <laughs> it. Yes. Yeah, but you can't give, a, you can't give an interpretation <laughs> of it. But I think what it does do, what the fact of its existence means that an older sort of physics, strict materialistic... I know Newton wasn't mm. a materialist, but it, uh, right. that clockwork of the universe yeah. died in 1925, and it'll never come back again. And that, that is something that just opens up. Explain 1925. Oh, well, that's when the well. first uh, quantum mechanical theories yeah, were yeah. produced and when Einstein wrote his great yeah. papers on yeah. uh, um, uh, things to do with quantum mechanics. So after that, I mean, you had, it's, it's not that we've now, we know what quantum mechanics is and that, that tells us as a god. I'm not at all saying that. I'm just saying a very restrictive view of the material universe has been undermined and where things are much more open to new possibilities. Um, uh, gentlemen, I'm very aware we've used the term quantum mechanics, but actually it won't be accessible to everybody. Uh, are you able to give us a nutshell? Uh, understanding? As an al abstract algebra. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that Richard Feynman's remarks, he's yeah. a world famous Nobel Prize winning physicist, he says about quantum mechanics that the amazing thing is that it works, but nobody understands it, and believe me, they don't. And was it he who said, <laughs> if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you, no, it's Bohr, wasn't it? You don't understand quantum mechanics. Yes, you, I, yeah. I think the, the point is really that at those sub-microscopic levels... So we're dealing with a physics of subatomic We We are indeed, and we're, we're really discovering small. that we mm. cannot, for instance observe position and momentum simultaneously. The things that we're used to in the classical world and the Newton Newtonian world don't hold true anymore. And there's a famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that mm. brings into our mathematical study of the physical world an ineliminable element of uncertainty and opens up all kinds of possibilities that philosophers now debate 
so, so the big macroscopic world in which planets operate, etc., you and I operate, has a particular uh, classical uh, physics governing it. At this subatomic level, there's a different whole set of uh, quantum mechanical ideas. That's right. And it doesn't seem to perform in the same way. So, yeah. Yes, but it, it opens up all sorts of questions, which is why Keith was saying mm. th that Roger Penrose felt he should have brought consciousness more into it, because once you have the role of the observer, mm. you're bringing consciousness mm. yeah. into yeah. the question directly. But that question of the split between the humanities and the, and the sciences... Ironically, it seems to me that we're back today to an almost similar situation in 1860 where Huxley was driving for the hegemony of science. Mm, mm. We've got a similar drive on the part of Dawkins and the New Atheists that science almost has become the only way to truth. And I think, therefore, we need to discuss perhaps the whole question of does science have limits? Mm. Are there other ways to truth? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think a very good person to look at here is Sir Isaiah Berlin, who had this very famous um, threefold division. Isaiah Berlin was a wonderful philosopher and historian of ideas, and he was very involved in logical positivism for a while, then kind of moved away from it. He said, look, there are three, if you like, bodies of knowledge, what science can prove, what reason can prove, and then there's everything else, and in the everything else pile is an awful lot of things that really matter. Yeah. Like, is democracy better than fascism? What is the good life? How do we live it? Is there a God? I think it's very important to say, look, both reason and science have their limits. They may be rationally persuasive at points, but they might be existentially deficient. They don't actually answer the big questions that really puzzle people. And I think, again, this brings us to a, the point we, we talked about earlier, which is that very often there are things that really matter that can't be proved. But actually we feel the evidence form is good enough to allow us to take them on board. So I think that it's very important to say, look, there are things that we are right and we believe to be important that can't be proved. But also John's point, which is that maybe both reason and science have their limits. And the real problem comes from those who won't respect those limits. And I think that's something we need to talk about a bit more. Well, I think we will pursue that when we look at a couple of other themes for our discussion. But just looking to wind this up, we've, we've had a, a view, we've had a discussion on science and religion. And we've seen that historically, uh, many of the good scientists, those who have advanced the cause of scientific knowledge, have done so from a theistic basis, and particularly in the West. However, concurrently with that, we've had, as we reflect upon it, notions of, of uh, debate, of conflict between science and religion, which actually on closer scrutiny is not always borne out. Coming to today, we do find that you've got people like Stephen Jay Gould suggesting that these two magisteria or realms of knowledge, religion and science, should be kept separate. And we're not actually happy with that because actually there is a lot of overlap and an interface and discussion to be had between them. And then you've got others who are saying today that one should be preeminent and people like Dawkins saying that it's only scientific knowledge which counts and yet you're alerting us to the fact that we must be alert, aware of the fact that there are limits to this, limits to scientific knowledge and indeed limits to religious understanding. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Jervis. Uh, I have with me three guests, eminent men who in the world of academia have served for much of their life in Oxford, three professors. We're going to discuss together further issues on the theme of philosophy, science and religion. I have with me uh, Professor John Lennox, Professor of Mathematics, serving in Oxford. Professor Keith Ward, Regis Professor Emeritus of Divinity, uh, serving in Oxford. And Professor Alistair McGrath, Professor of Theology.
Gentlemen, I want us to go on in our discussions now to look at the theme of fundamentalism. Uh, it's often banded around in a very uh, negative way, a pejorative term thrown at people of religion, they're fundamentalists. But the term, Keith, the term um, actually originally didn't have this negative connotation, did it? Well, in the Christian world, I suppose it's mostly associated with a group uh, in Chicago, a big meeting in Chicago, which published a series of pamphlets called The Fundamentals. Uh, and it was, so it was about Christian fundamentals, and that was a specific group of doctrines. I think there were seven of them originally. Um, things like virgin birth, literal happening of the miracles. So liter um, I stress on the literal uh, interpretation of the Bible, that it, what it said was true. And then some particular doctrines about the substitutionary theory of atonement and so on. So they were, it was a specific yeah. program. So yes. the, there was that program, and uh, it is uh, one part of, of Christian belief. But today the term has come to mean something very pejorative, so very, very negative, and people are accused of being Islamic fundamentalists, religious fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, etc. And fundamentalism, is it a label any of you would be happy to have prescribed to you? Well, I, I'm not a fundamentalist. Uh, right. That is to say, I don't accept... I personally don't accept all the things that occur in the list of <laughs> fundamentals. Right. Um, most particularly, uh, I'm... I'm Proud. I'm pleased. I, I'm not embarrassed to call myself a liberal evangelical. And by that I mean I don't uh, take a literal interpretation of the whole of Scripture. And I, so, I mean, that's one particular yeah. view you could take. And then you say, oh, well, I wouldn't call myself a fundamentalist. But I was converted by, to Christianity by fundamentalists. And I don't think it's evil or wicked or depraved. It's just uh, that's your interpretation. Well, of one thing I want to come on to is our interpretation and use of scripture, and with particular reference to its interface with science. Um, the term fundamentalist, is it something that you'd run a mile from? Well, the trouble is the shift in meaning. Yeah. If you're asking me the question, are there certain fundamental things I believe, like the virgin birth, the resurrection, and so on, mm. I would say, yes, I believe in those fundamentals. But if you interpret it in terms of a literalistic interpretation of Scripture, even at the most obvious level, that is not the case. Jesus said, I am the door. He didn't mean he was made of wood. We have to take into account that literature includes metaphor at yeah. the very lowest level. Yeah. And I think the basic issue is not so much the what, it's the how you hold your beliefs. And we tend to use this word in a pejorative sense because we're thinking of folks who hold their beliefs and they're not open to critical inspection or open to reflection. But unfortunately, you see, we can use the word fundamentalist to describe anything on a spectrum from the peace-loving Amish to Islamist fundamentalist terrorists. And so the word has become almost useless for sensible, intelligent discourse. So I would want to concentrate on two separate things. There are the things that are believed, but then there is the way in which one holds them. And it seems to me it's very important to distinguish between those two. Now, you're operating in the worlds of both science and religion, having your biologist background, having your theology. Uh, these terms, as, as referring to the scientific world and the religious world, are they... Um, terms which you think are inappropriate? Well, I think, uh, as both John and Keith were saying, I mean, the, the word fundamentalist meant something once. Now it's simply become a term of abuse. And, and yeah. really it means someone who is very aggressive, someone who perhaps doesn't think very much. I think if a sociologist were here, he or she would say it, it's about a reactive form of faith, which is mm. saying, I feel threatened by these people, so I react by stating things in a very aggressive way. I just don't think it's helpful anymore. I mean, there are fundamentalist Christians, there are fundamentalist Muslims, there are fundamentalist atheists now as well. Mm. So I think really it, it's a word that doesn't carry very much conviction. I think for me, the, the bigger question really is how do we interact intelligently right. and graciously mm -hmm. with people we disagree with? And the, the best way of alienating, not simply the people you're talking to, but the audience listening in, is to call them fundamentalists. So I think it's a word that has had its day and actually doesn't really convey very much meaning at the moment. It's That's also used as a term to shout down people and to avoid discussion. Well, that's right. I mean, if you want to shut down a discussion, you say you're a fundamentalist. And in effect, that's a rhetorical way of saying, I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to have this conversation. But I think there are some very important conversations we want to keep going. I think this is one of them. 
But is there a sense in which the term, and let's not dwell on the term too long, but is there a sense in which it is saying we have the full picture within our discipline? We don't want to engage with anything else, be it religion, be it science. Religion gives me the total package. I think that, that, that fundamentalism, as usually understood, is characterised by absolute certainty of conviction. Yeah. In other words, I am right. And that means that somebody who holds a different opinion is not simply perhaps right in parts. They are totally wrong because they don't buy into the total picture. Mm. And so you do find that in religions. You also find it in the new atheism. You know, there's this very big polarisation, those who are in, the brights, those who are out, the dimwits. And I think it's very, very unhelpful. And we need to say, I think, that one of the greatest barriers to intelligent, reflective talking about things is the use of the word fundamentalism or the mindset that comes with it. And you, yeah. you can tell immediately if someone says, you know, you are a fool because of this belief or you are evil because of this belief, you are talking to somebody who is a fundamentalist, though they may not use that word. You introduced the term brights there, which was a term which a number of uh, atheists took to themselves to imply that everybody else outside that group was Yes, it's an upbeat way of talking about atheism, yeah. and I have to say it's really very arrogant. I mean, yeah. the opposite of bright is dim. I'm very happy to be called dim, but I think as a dim person I can still see the problems they have with their beliefs. Yeah. Now, uh, Peter Atkins, I referred to him earlier, he made this statement, uh, a classic expression of this view in one sense. There is uh, Peter uh, teaching chemistry at Oxford, known to you. There is no reason to suppose that science cannot deal with every aspect of existence. <laughs> John, that's scientism, isn't it? It's scientism. It's the idea that science is the only way to truth. I think Bertrand Russell put it best, although he didn't, in fact, espouse that view completely himself. What science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know. Now, I respect Russell as a, as a logician, but his logic defeated him there because that statement, what science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know, is not a statement of science. And therefore, if it's true, it's false. It's one of those things that, Take me through that logically story. collapses. <laughs> well, his statement is yes. simply a statement of his own personal belief. It's not a statement that comes out of science. Science itself doesn't tell us what science cannot tell us mankind cannot know. It goes too far, and therefore it's what we call yeah. logically incoherent. I think Sir Peter Medawar had got the right end of the stick when he said it's very easy to see that science has its limitations. All you have to do is ask the questions of a child. Where have I come from? Where am I going to? What is the meaning of life? And you will see that science has reached its limit. Are they legitimate questions, Keith? I mean, what's the meaning of life? Well, is it a question yeah, or a question? I think that's a legitimate question, which a lot of people ask. Uh, but, uh, of course, there are lots of different sciences, you have to say. Yes. But uh, a hard science, a typical hard science, will answer questions about things you can measure, uh, that you can control experimentally, where you can repeat the experiment, where everybody can agree to it if they have the training, and which you can predict. So those things are typical of a hard scientific view. Measurement prediction, control, experimental control, repeatability, public observation. Now, most things in human life are not like that. We can't repeat them, we can't control them, we can't even predict them. Look what economists do to our uh, world. So, uh, you know, it's impossible to do that. But that doesn't mean these are not scientific in any sense. It just means that if you're defining the sorts of science which are standard, you know, that cannot deal with problems of personal experience. Uh, let me give you an example, yeah, one on. example. So last night I had a very pleasant evening dreaming. I'm not going to tell you what I was dreaming about, but I was dreaming. Okay. Now, I know that I was dreaming. I remember very clearly that I was dreaming. There is absolutely no way I can repeat that, control that, predict it, experiment on it, or convince you that what it was about. You can't find out. So I know something. I know that I was dreaming last night that you couldn't possibly know unless I told you. So, now, there are lots of things like yeah, that in life, but that's yeah. just one very clear example of something where, well, there's something, you know, that uh, can only be known by personal experience. Now, we need to move Go beyond on. that because yeah. I think, um, just taking Keith's ideas a little bit further, I mean, people are concerned about meaning and value. And science is empirical. It's looking at, you know, the, the empirical world, the experiential world, and saying, what do we see going on there? But if you're asking the question, what is it worth and what's the point of it? You're asking questions that go way beyond science. 
And if you look at, for example, someone like Roy Baumeister, his very famous book, The Meanings of Life, and he'll say that the big questions you've got to answer are questions like, who am I? Why am I here? Do I matter to anyone? And these actually go way beyond the legitimate scope of science. And that's why I think Richard Dawkins is right when he says, very famously, that science has no means of saying what is ethical. Mm. And mm. being ethical is very, very important. I bet everyone listening to this conversation will say, well, to me it matters what is right and what is wrong. And so let's just focus on that. Science can tell us what's right, what's wrong. There's nothing wrong with science. That's just the way it is. Right and wrong matter profoundly. The problem comes when some people say, well, let's use science to tell us that when it can't tell us that. It's about the abuse of science. And in many ways, the big problem many people face today is those who, for their own agendas, are saying, let's get science to answer questions it can't answer. Yeah, so it's really, I suppose in one, one sense, what we're moving on to is a notion of reductionism, nothing buttery. That mm. It's that, for instance, any description of the world or any description of any scenario or situation is, is nothing but this particular description in material terms. I mean, you've drawn our attention earlier to materialism and idealism. Mm. Keith, reductionism, is it of any value? It's of value methodologically. Mm. By that I mean uh, it's helpful to break a thing into its parts to find yeah. out how it's made. So in some natural sciences it's very, very important, reductionism. You want to, first of all, break a thing up into its parts and then analyse them. But even in the hard sciences, I think, and Alistair knows better about biology, it doesn't give the whole story because sometimes you need to see things as a whole. You, human cells in a body, perhaps you need to know how they work by looking at the whole body and how they coordinate. Mm. So reducing things to just things in the cell is not going to give you the answer of how, a, how an organism works. So a reductive explanation is not even very convincing in the biological sciences, uh, in fact, not even in chemistry. So... Um, so it's useful for some purposes to reduce things yes. to their component parts, whatever they are, atoms, electrons, quarks, whatever. But even in the sciences, a reductionism is not going to cope with the questions about the ecosphere, for example, ecology, yeah. questions of how things relate to each other. Well, it is, in one sense, this conversation is an example. You could break it down and analyse it in terms of verbal communication and the auditory signals and messages and light and all the rest of it. But actually, there's a conversation going on. Mm -hmm. It's the bigger picture. I think one of the great confusions, and I see it in Dawkins and elsewhere, is the, there are different levels of explanation which relates to this topic. And very often the argument goes like this. Science has discovered a mechanism that does X, Y, and Z. Therefore, there's no God. That's putting it very crudely. And what they're doing is confusing mechanism with agency. If I raise my hand, I can give an explanation at a mechanistic level in terms of neurons and muscles and all this kind of thing. But I could equally well give an agent explanation in terms of I raise my hand to make a point. In other words, agency and mechanism are not in competition with one another. They're different levels of explanation. And I think that... The failure to see that is endemic in the new atheist camp. So mechanism is actually looking at a process, describing, That's breaking right. down, reducing it to a process, and an agency is saying, well, what was the purpose behind that? Yeah, let that? me what give you an it? example yeah, of that. I never forget having this discussion, but I've had it many times yeah. since, where I was sitting at dinner in Oxford, and I was introduced to a very eminent microbiologist... And when he discovered I was a mathematician, he said how utterly boring, and he meant it. So I tried to defend myself and said, well, actually, I'm interested in the bigger questions of life. Oh, he said, like what? I said, well, what is ultimate reality? Oh, he said, it's far worse than I thought. Listen, <laughs> I'm an atheist, I'm a reductionist, and we're going to have a miserable evening. And he meant it. So I said, are you really? You're a reductionist. Everything is explainable in terms of physics and chemistry, because I'm a methodological reductionist, as Keith has said. Yes, he said, that's what I believe. So I said, let's do an experiment then. He said, an experiment here at dinner? I said, yes, fine, let's have a look at this menu. <laughs> so I picked up the menu, and he said, it's roast chicken, what's the problem? I said, that's the problem. I said, you believe that everything can be explained in terms of physics and chemistry? He said, that's right. OK, I said, explain to me the semiotics of these letters, R-O-A-S-T, chicken. That is the way they carry meaning in terms of the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. And there was sort of dead silence. 
And his wife rather too loudly nudged him and said, get out of that if you can. <laughs> but he didn't try. He said something astonishing. He said, you know, John, for 40 years, I've gone into my laboratory in Oxford thinking that this could be done. But it quite obviously can't. You've got to have an agent yeah. to explain the meaning of that writing. So I rather cheekily said, you mean an agent of the gaps? <laughs> and he said, no, 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 no. The very nature of the writing demands an agency. And then it dawned on him that I wasn't bright enough to have thought of that argument. He said, where did you get that argument? I said, I confess, I got it from a Nobel Prize winner, Roger Sperry, the psychiatrist yeah. that got a psychiatrist to take consciousness seriously. And I think that's a very good example. You cannot reduce the meaning property of writing to raw physics and chemistry. In our discussion, philosophy, science, religion, I want to take what you've just said. Um, maybe you can help us with this, Keith. How might we apply that to questions of God's existence? Is this the agent? Well, I suppose uh, if you believe in God, yeah. I would say yeah. you are believing that the ultimate cause of the universe and the ultimate reality behind the universe is an agent. And therefore it cannot be explained merely in mechanical no, it's not a, terms. a yeah. cause, yeah. generally yeah. speaking, is something that operates in accordance with a general yeah. law. So mm. same cause, same effect. Yeah. But God, whoever believes in God, doesn't think God's like that. There's some law which makes God create the universe. So it must be a personal agency. It must be that, that sort of a very different explanation. Um, so even to posit that there is a God is to say that purely causal, reductive, mm. law-like explanation is not enough. It's fantastic on its own. But if you ask questions about goals, purposes, meanings, values, all those things, yeah. you're talking about personal agencies. And although God is far beyond ordinary persons, well, I'm not bringing God down to that, yeah. God is much more like a personal agency uh, than like a mm. material cause or any sort of ordinary cause. So I think that's crucial. Um, even atheists ought to be able to think of this as a thought experiment mm. that yeah. maybe there is a personal cause behind the universe. It, it's a perfectly coherent possibility. Well, probably when we come on to look at worldviews, which we will do shortly, we'll see that why a worldview might preclude that or even make it possible, this notion of cause and effect in a closed system. But um, that's why I suppose, going back to the question I put to you, Alistair, very, very briefly, nothing buttery, i.e. to describe the world as nothing but in a reductionist way, is actually foreclosing the discussion. It's foreclosing the discussion. I mean, I want to emphasise that in many ways science is doing something sensible, yeah. saying, look, at a purely natural level, how can we explain this as simply as possible? <laughs> but the danger is, if you make that into a view of reality, if the tool determines what reality is, then in effect you say, reality is limited to what science can disclose. And that's a surefire recipe for simply skimming the surface of reality. The whole point is mm. to go deep. Mm. Science is great, wonderful within its limits, but the really interesting questions lie beyond those limits, and I want to explore them. That's a very helpful discussion to appreciate, in a sense, that this notion of fundamentalism, which forecloses discussion, the idea that you can reduce our understanding of this universe and its meaning merely to a description of its processes and mechanisms, is inadequate. And that there is this notion that beyond that, there might lie an ultimate explanation. So, in one sense, that's been a very helpful discussion, and I look forward to pursuing it in our further talks. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Chris Jervis and we're continuing our series of discussions on themes related to philosophy, science and religion. And I have with me three eminent professors, all with an Oxford background. John Lennox, Professor of Mathematics, Keith Ward, Professor of Philosophy and Divinity, and Alastair McGrath, a Professor of Theology, but also with a background in Biology. We've discussed various themes, and I want us now to take this an examination of worldviews. And I guess by that I'm assuming that it means something like a framework of understanding. Is that a reasonable definition, Keith? Yeah, it's quite a modern expression in that sense. I think the old, old philosophical word for it would be metaphysics. I mean, that word has a long history, but it really it doesn't mean beyond physics or anything like that. It just means the ultimate nature of things. What is what is the ultimate nature of things? So a worldview is something which presents what you think your worldview is, what you think the ultimate nature of reality is. It might sound a bit grand, it's too grand for some people, but some people think that uh, this world that we see, for example, the common sense world, chairs, tables in space, mm. is what that ultimately is, that, that's it. Well, that's a worldview. It's a common sense worldview. And then some people might say, no, the real world, what ultimately exists is atoms, quarks, electrons, superstrings. This, what science tells you is the truth. And that's a different worldview. We have a scientific worldview. Mm. Science, as such, doesn't have a worldview, but scientists could have a worldview if they think, what science tells you is the ultimate truth. So that's the question. What do you think is ultimately true? What really, in the end, underlies your common sense experience? That raises for me a question. I'll address this one to you, Alistair. Um, does, take science, does science come first or the worldview come first? If I do my science, does it lead me to a, have a framework of understanding or do I have my framework of understanding and then do my science? Well, I think you'd expect that a scientist being an objective person would say, let's do the science and then develop the worldview. But I think psychologists have long shown that really what happens is that, um, on the whole, scientists have worldviews already, and they bring that way of thinking, that, that framework, if you like, to actually doing a scientific enterprise, which is why you have some scientists who will say, very categorically, um, there is no God, science shows it. Equally, there'll be others saying, no, 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 science shows us there is a God, because, in effect, what they are doing is they're bringing their worldview to their scientific enterprise and it's showing them different things. Well, I think the important thing to do is to realise that worldviews are inevitable, that as we think about things, as we reflect on things, we begin to develop these maps of reality, which not just make sense of the world, but also make sense of ourselves as people who think and people who yeah. act, and actually, therefore, they're inevitable. But that doesn't mean we can evade the question of what the best worldview is. And so in many ways, we've got to ask questions like, you know, what is the evidence for this worldview? How good is it at making sense of things? And so those questions are not going to go away. So if you have a worldview, a framework of understanding of this world, and actually it doesn't match up to reality, something's got to give. Something's got to give. And, and indeed, that's one of the reasons why I ceased being an atheist and became a Christian. Um, reading C.S. Lewis, he, he has some very interesting things to say on this. And one of his favourite quotes from me is this, from an essay he wrote called, Is Theology Poetry? I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not just because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And what Lewis was saying there is that the ability of a worldview to, to make sense of things, to, to, to put on a map, so to speak, is an indication of its truth. And so if your way of thinking doesn't correspond to the way things are, then either you are deluded or you need to say something needs to change. I've got to do some serious rethinking. It strikes me that the elements of this are becoming rather subjective. Your discipline in mathematics presumably is highly objective. Does the notion of worldviews impinge or impact upon mathematics at all? Well, it impinges in a sense, because working in the kind of abstract mathematics I do, where you have a clear kind of axiomatic system and logic and so on, the worldview question starts further back in our concept of rationality and why it is we should trust it or not. And I think one of the very important things you've raised here is that because we live in a world where science has enormous cultural authority, there is a tendency on the part of some to give the public the impression that their worldview has come directly out of their science. But what I find refreshing is that there are one or two people 
who are very open and honest about this. Richard Lewinton, for example, who's a famous geneticist at Harvard, he says quite openly that it's not science itself that compels us to accept a materialistic explanation of the universe. It's rather the other way around. Because of our a priori commitment to materialism, we believe it to start with, that we must find a materialistic solution. And he goes as far as to say, for we cannot allow a divine foot through the door. Now, that's a very, very interesting confession so that, to my that mind. that worldview is determining what is acceptable evidence or how that in, evidence is interpreted, etc. Absolutely right. But he is at least being honest about it. Mm. And I think the very important thing is, as we look at this subject, and sometimes people may feel, look, this is a very complex subject. There's many worldviews as there are people. And in a sense, that's true. But in another sense, as Keith reminded us in an earlier discussion, the families of worldviews split rather simply. There are the people who believe that this universe is all that there is, materialism essentially, and then there are those who believe it isn't all that there is. There's something more. There's a God who created it. And then I suppose there's another family of worldviews that says, well, God and us and the whole universe are one. And crudely speaking, we call that the pantheistic family of worldviews. So in a sense, everybody finds themselves somewhere here because whether or not we articulated or thought it through, all of us have a worldview which we bring to reality. And it's a very good thing to start to recognise what that is. Keith, if I went to, with a little recorder onto the streets in the nearby town and said to somebody, what is your worldview? I might get a very blank stare, but if we take what John's point, everybody has a worldview. Does that mean to say they are aware of it? Uh, I do think everybody has a worldview, um, and uh, it's not a question of uh, uh, whether or not they have one. It's what their worldview is, and most people have a common sense worldview. I would say they just say, think, well, here we are. There are tables and chairs, but anybody can show that that's false. I mean, it's quite perfectly easy to show that uh, this table wouldn't look the way it looks to us. If it wasn't being observed by us, it would be very different. We mostly, as uh, people have said, empty space with atoms buzzing around in it. It's going to be very different. And I think the ultimate uh, question about that is, well, people can get um, persuaded into accepting that sort of very scientific worldview, right, that science tells you what the world is like, because it's culturally dominant. But in fact, the theist, the God worldview, right, is what you're saying is, no, the ultimate reality behind uh, all that we actually see is a reality with consciousness, with power, with wisdom. I mean, it's God. So mm. it's, it's a mind of power and wisdom and goodness. And the, that's a worldview. And I believe, actually, that most people have that worldview, that most people don't think as materialists. Materialism is a very abstract very sophisticated notion indeed, and they might get culturally um, persuaded into saying they're materialists, but most people have a sense that there's something else that through your experience you're aware of a personal presence behind it, really. You might not know how to formulate that. So I really think that, uh, well, I believe, of course, we are created by God, so it's not surprising that most people have a sense that there mm. is a personal presence in their experience, but they get persuaded that this is an illusion of some sort because it can't be true, because science shows it can't be true. But the natural worldview, I think, is the theistic one. The natural way to think is there is a personal uh, presence uh, somehow in my experience, and then the question of what's it like. Well, Alice, you're nod nodding vigorously at that, etc., but presumably somebody who has this scientism-type view, i.e. that tells you everything, materialism, etc., would say, well, that's just the result, this feeling that something else is just the result of neurosis or a bad dinner. Well, they might say that, but I would hope they'd be more reflective. I mean, the view that what you see is what you get uh, can very easily shift from being a, a good starting point to a totalising view of reality, which says that's it. And so very often in some uh, more aggressive atheist writings, you'll say, well, of course, there isn't a God, therefore, how can you believe in God if there is no God to believe in? So that's a delusion, isn't it? But that's a... I think it started very, from that point. Exactly. Saying, it's yeah, a conclusion, yes. which is masquerading, which is actually you know, being treated as something that is self-evidencing. Yeah. I think that does need to be challenged. I think that for me, the really important thing is to say is this. If you say what you see is what you get, what if there are certain things that you see that seem to point beyond themselves. I mean, C.S. Lewis makes mm. the point very, very clearly that the world is 
studded with clues and pointers saying this is not all that there is. Our, our sense of mortality, our longing for something of ultimate significance, the very ordering of the world, these are all clues that say to us what you see is a good starting point, it's not the end point, there's more that needs to be said. Keith, uh, John made reference to uh, the fact that you had spoken of uh, these families of worldviews, these perspectives we have on life, these frameworks of understanding. Um, and whilst there are many, uh, he hinted that they can cluster in these two or three broad categories. Do you want to explain that for us? Well, that's right. I think if you look uh, at the history of human thinking in the world, you do get uh, what John called a pantheistic view, that is a, a, a monist, macro monist view, because you're saying there's only one reality, really, and the physical world is an expression of it, but it's the same thing. So is thing. pantheism the same as monism? Um, well, yes. Uh, sort of, right. <laughs> sort yeah. of. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Pantheism just means everything is God. God is everything, Pantheism, God is everything, ev God is part and everything parcel of everything. Yep, yep. And monism says there's just one thing, really, which sounds odd because there's tables and chairs and people, yeah, yeah. but you're saying but we're all parts yeah, of the yeah. one so reality. That's one view. And that's one view. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, it could be a material reality, just atoms and energy, matter, or it could be a spiritual reality, um, mm -hmm. which would be... Um, something like a consciousness of wisdom and bliss and compassion. Okay? Mm. But the, the Christian view is uh, somewhere in the middle there and, and uh, states that God is, in fact, a mind of compassion and wisdom and bliss, but creates the universe. That's, the universe is not the same as God. It stands it, apart from it. Mm. Well, I wouldn't say apart, because right. it's, the universe is never totally apart from God. God is never somewhere yeah. else. Mm. As right. well. gotcha. But nevertheless, yeah. it's created by yeah, God yeah. and depends yeah. upon God. Yeah. And I think there's a very... Mm. People have that sense in, in looking at a beautiful scene. You, you feel there's some transcendent presence, you know, underneath it, which mm. is um, making itself known. That's a very natural way to feel. And I think that's the beginning. It's an intimation. Mm. It's a hint mm. of God. And so that's, that's a, I think that's a natural worldview, and it's, people get persuaded out of that by arguments that, oh no, that's just an illusion, because there's no such being. And I think philosophy shows you that, as a matter of fact, the arguments for there being such a being are as good, if not better than, mm. uh, the argument that uh, everything's made of matter, which strikes me as a pretty doubtful uh, worldview. John? I find a helpful way of looking at this brings us back to what for me is one of the central statements in the New Testament. At the beginning of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. All things were made by him. And it seems to me that the worldview tension that we're really talking about is between two diametrically opposed interpretations of the universe. One says, in the beginning was the Word, that is intelligence, God, logos, and mass energy are derivative, all things were made by him. The materialistic stroke naturalistic worldview says the exact opposite. That is, in the beginning with the particles of the quantum vacuum or whatever it was, mass energy is in the beginning and everything else is derivative, including mind and the idea of God. Of course, there isn't a God. So God becomes a sort of psychogenic projection. Th that's we, right. We, yeah. So mm -hmm. there's that tension. And the worldview question that relates to the science-religion debate seems to me to be this. With which worldview does science sit most comfortably? And I, of course, want to argue that it is the Christian worldview that science sit most comfortably with mm. in this whole scheme of possible worldviews. John, uh, well, I want to start with you, Alistair, actually, but John mentioned just there um, uh, about belief in God coming from material matter i.e. that you start with materialism and it becomes a sort of psychogenic belief starting in the mind. But the problem here is if I say to somebody, I believe in God, if they're not adopting the same framework of understanding that I have, they might hear me saying, that's fine for you, that's OK, if you've projected this belief in a deity which you need, uh, but I'm not actually saying that. Is that a, a problem? We need to address people's worldviews before we can have 
reasonable discussion? Well, I think we have to, really, because they are there whether we like them or not. Mm. And very often people actually assume a lot of ideas without realising they've done it. It's a kind of unconscious thing. Mm. And certainly, I mean, very often you'll find atheists saying, well, of course, you just believe in God because you want to. It's a kind of need thing. Yeah. I think in my own case, I discovered God out of intellectual curiosity. I mean, I, it was like believing there was only water to drink, and then you discover champagne. You know, it, it's, it's realising there's something even better mm. there, which makes far more sense of things. So I think in many ways, one of the things we need to reflect on is that very often people have a, have a worldview which they haven't really thought about very much, and then something happens which changes challenges them. Either they see things in a new way or actually very often they become ill or their situation changes and they're forced to think long and hard about what the meaning of life is. And very often that's like opening a doorway which opens into all kinds of new possibilities. So worldviews are open to challenge and open to revision. And very often we use the word conversion to refer to that process. Can I yeah. just uh, come in here? Because uh, like Alistair, I think I'm a convert. Uh, but, and I, I agree with all this stuff about worldviews, I've said some of it myself, but I think it's important to say that actually really believing in God is not a matter of having a worldview, it's a matter of personal experience. And that God comes to individuals as a personal presence to change their lives. I mean, that God is actually a dynamic uh, power which changes people's lives from egoism into worship of God, into worship of something other than yourself. And that's a particular experience. So for me, the experience is very, very important. And if you believe in God, you at least hope to have that experience or maybe you get glimpses of it and you want more of it. Uh, and it's God offering you uh, that experience of his own presence, just like a person mm. might talk mm. to you. So mm. you're not saying you're making this up. You know, Do you have a worldview of there being other persons? <laughs> no, you just uh, experience them. And I think you experience God... But where worldviews come in is that your experience has to make sense. You know, is it a delusion? All right, God is experience for personal presence and reality. It, it seems to be a challenge to your life and a transformation of your life. And you think, is this just a psychological mm. quirk? Mm. And that's where, if you have a work, you see that there's a, a huge, coherent, well worked out worldview which almost every major philosopher in history has accepted which says that the heart of reality is mind and intelligence and consciousness. Well, you say, how, why should I call that an illusion? Because it fits into the view which most philosophers have always accepted as the best thing we've got. Let me just thank you, gentlemen, for that. Clearly, an ex exploration of world views is very important to understand the framework of understanding that people have, that we have, and how from that so much can come as we explore the world, explore materialism, its adequacy or inadequacy, and theism and the worldviews that we adopt. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chris Jervis, and we're engaged in a series of discussions on the themes of philosophy, science, and religion. It's looking at the big questions, and I suppose the biggest question is the question of God and God's existence and its engagement with science. I have with me three very eminent professors, and I'm very pleased to introduce them to you. Professor Alistair McGrath, Professor in Theology, Professor Keith Ward in Divinity with a historic background in philosophy, and Professor John Lennox, mathematician. Now, gentlemen, I want to pursue with you a discussion on the theme of, I suppose it's been called design, some have called it intelligent design, but it's this, if we look at the natural world, and historically people have looked at the natural world and detected within it elements of order, design, I think particularly of William Paley writing in his book Natural Theology, 
What has been the contribution, Alistair? What's been the contribution of that line of argument? Let's take us back to William Paley and what he was saying. Well, William Paley in 1802 wrote a book called Natural Theology, in which he looked at the, for him, marvellous design of biological organisms, above all the human eye. And Paley's basic argument was, look, these things don't just happen by accident. I mean, if we make a telescope, that's some intelligent person thinking we need an instrument that does this, it has to be designed, it has to be made. And Paley says we see a similar kind of thing happening in the natural world. And so Paley was really saying that intelligent observation of the natural world leads us to the inference that these are not simply random or accidental happenings, but rather there is an obvious process of design in terms of what we perceive, the human eye being a very good example. So Paley is really saying design is about the outcomes. Now, of course, there's another possibility, which is design is about the processes that lead to those outcomes. In other words, you set up a process which leads to the desired outcomes, and it's the process which shows the design. So in many ways, Paley was opening up the debate and making it very clear where he stood. I think the debate continues, but Paley himself, I think, now lies some distance in the past. In fact, you've mentioned the past, but could it go even further back? I failed to mention, of course, that biblical writers spoke about the heavens declaring the glory of God. Uh, Paul, writing in the New Testament, talking about God's character being perceived in the things he's made. And I suppose in one sense, Keith, let me address this one to you. In one sense, this whole history of saying we can look out on this world and from it deduce information about God, God's existence and character. Well, I, I don't like the, the word deduce, Chris. <laughs> um, but I think it is true that uh, the order of the world and the fact that this planet supports life, which is uh, only possible because of very unusual circumstances, like with the right distance from the sun, or protected by Jupiter from some planets, etc. All sorts of uh, different uh, considerations show it's very improbable that life would occur. Uh, and just looking around at the world, of course, it does seem uh, a marvellously uh, ordered place. So I think that's, that's an impressive uh, sort of argument to begin with. Uh, but I don't think the Bible talks about deduction. It, it, right. It's more just a natural sense of the presence of God in the order of nature. I mean, we have to bear in mind they didn't know anything about laws of nature. They weren't talking about laws of nature in the way that we are. So the biblical writers were really in awe... And it's a sense of awe, was it, rather than... Yes, I think it was a sense of awe and a, a yeah. sense of reverence uh, in yeah. God's immediate expression and presence yeah. in the things of the world. But we have to say, I think, that uh, since the rise of uh, science in the 16th century, we don't have a very different view of the universe. But I think that different view is much grander. I mean, the universe is much larger than they thought, uh, and uh, there are more amazing things in it than they thought. And so I don't think it, it has made God less relevant. I think uh, the impression of order in the universe is strong enough, is even stronger. to think this is a God who's made not just one planet, but billions of galaxies in the universe. And that's an impressive thought. Yeah. It's not a deduction. It's a, right. it's a natural sense, I think, of... For, God's, of the universe being God's handiwork. Yes. John, I mean... Well, I find it very interesting that in this New Testament statement that we're referring to about Paul, I think it's worded very carefully. And he says that certain things, as, as, as Keith has just said, they're not proved. He says they're perceived. And it's a perception. But I'm interested to note that the perception, according to Paul is very firmly, uh, is very strong, because he goes on to say, so they are without excuse. So it seems to me, it's a kind of axiom in which I operate, that nature is not neutral. You can see in the universe evidence of its intelligent origin. And I think you're quite right to emphasize that it doesn't just go back to Paley. It is a very ancient notion indeed. In fact, I'm sure Keith would agree that if you think of classical philosophers all through the ages, this was one of the basic views, yeah. that nature is not all there is, there's a mind behind it. And what we're doing is connecting dots here. And we're saying, well, what can you perceive in nature? I also notice, though, that the Apostle Paul is very careful not to overstate he doesn't tell you that everything can be known about God. In fact, he only names two things, his power and Godhead. And I presume that means that there is a God and that he's powerful. If we want to go beyond that, we'll have to take in evidence from other 
in places. Yeah. yeah. Now, Alice, if I can come back to you, uh, you mentioned in Paley's work that uh, he looked at the eye and other attributes of the human body in the natural world. But then, of course, uh, it's one of those nice accidents of history that he's an old boy of the same Cambridge College as Darwin, who some years later initially attributed great significance to uh, Paley's work, uh, but later in life, had, following his work, he, he didn't revere it so much. But surely... Darwin has told us that these things can arise through gradual change, etc. So we have the sense of order now, rather than it being imposed from some external agent. Is that not so? Well, certainly that's one way of reading Darwin. Uh, Darwin himself was very appreciative of Paley, as you say, uh, particularly his descriptions of nature, uh, but obviously felt that, Darwin, that Paley's theory could not stand in its present form because of his own work on the development of natural selection. And so I guess the question really is, where do we stand now? And in many ways, Darwin himself saw himself as saying, look, it's not that these things arrived in their present form exactly as they are and always have been like this, that they have come to be like this. But Darwin was very careful to point out that the process by which they arrived itself could be seen as law-like. And so certainly some interpreters of Darwin would say, well, actually what Darwin was doing was uncovering the mechanism by which these complex organisms were there. So it really, I think means we have to rethink design in terms of not so much the final outcomes, but rather the processes by which they arose. And certainly I would want to say that in many ways, um, Darwin forces us to recalibrate Paley. I think one of the best summaries of, of Darwin's significance is by the English writer Charles Kingsley, who said, we, we used to know that God made all things, but now we know he was even wiser than that. He made things make themselves. In other words, he initiated the processes that led to these outcomes. So you're marrying together, if you like, a notion of hanging on to the idea of a creator and a process of evolution. I think what Kingsley was saying is actually a very fair point, that maybe some English theologians have understood the word creation to refer to a, an event, a one-off event. Maybe that's not right. Maybe creation refers to an event, but then an ongoing process which, if you like, unfolds or unpacks what happened in that event under God's providence. And certainly that is a very classic Christian approach to this that you find, for example, in Augustine of Hippo, a very famous theologian, writing in the early 5th century. So, in fact, there are Christian understandings of creation that can easily be adapted to this way of looking at things. You're telling me way back in the 5th century... Um, they weren't holding on to a literalistic understanding of the creation already at that stage. Yes, I'm telling you that. Yes. And, and Augustine's view yeah. is that God makes the world in an instant, but it, it is made in such a way that it will develop, that yeah. there are causalities embedded within it, so it's mm -hmm. going to emerge over a long period of time. And Augustine uses the word creation to refer to both the event by which these things are established and in the process by which, if you like, it changes into what God wants it to be. Can I yeah, add something to that? Um, yeah. I'm not going to disagree, just to amplify it a little bit, uh, that um, for Augustine and for all the great Christian theologians like Aquinas and Anselm, mm. etc., for over a thousand years, they didn't accept a literal interpretation of Genesis at all, and they didn't even think of creation primarily as an event, although you've said event, and they did partly say, yes, this was the origin of the universe. But the real doctrine that they had in mind was that creation was not actually the beginning of the universe. Because what God creates, and Augustine says this quite specifically, uh, what God creates is the whole of space and time. Okay, so if God creates the whole of time, he doesn't do it at the beginning of time. God creates time from beginning to end, timelessly, from beyond time. So, and one way to put that is to say God creates now, at every moment, that's creation. So, and I think it's a mistake, really, a very common mistake, to think creation was the origin yeah. of the universe. It's this not. Is creation is not origin. Creation is the dependence of every moment of time on something beyond time, and some God with consciousness and power and intellect. So this and is reason. 15 centuries before Einstein saying that time and space are themselves created. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and they were quite clear about it, yes. yes. So uh, the story of 
six days, etc., has great spiritual significance. But it, it wasn't what was important for all those early Christian writers. What was important is, as, as Alistair says, that God brings the whole of the temporal process into existence. Uh, and it's a f it's even, you could even see it, I don't want to press this too much, but you can even see it in the account of it being, uh, that it, it, the world developed, it did develop through stages, plants, yes. animals, you know, yeah. uh, human beings, and that, that was a development, uh, but all that was part of creation. Mm. Uh, Keith, I want to stay with you for a minute, because a minute ago you just mentioned the remarkable order in this mm. biological world, and indeed there is, the connectedness and things working together. There's an awful lot of chaos out there as well. Well, okay, yeah, so... Actually, that's in the Bible too, but let's, uh, I don't want to get too yeah. far into that. But certainly God, the Spirit of God, breathes over the waters of the abyss, uh, and that's the abyss of chaos. There's, there's some place, Leviathan, the great dragon of the deep, there's some place in the Bible for chaos and for that which is a threat to the being of the yeah. universe. Somehow God places limits on this. So it's a very biblical insight that yeah. God creates a universe which is not all, you know, plain sailing and easy and nothing to do. We've got a lot to wrestle with there, and of course <laughs> this whole notion of chaos and order, etc. Yeah. But where we encounter both, which we clearly do, you've still got to account for the order, haven't you? Mm. You do indeed. And uh, I may disagree slightly with my yeah. two colleagues yeah. here. I do take yeah. the point of the idea of creation not simply being an event, but I think the Augustinian notion that creation essentially means causing to be goes too far in the opposite direction. Perhaps because it's, I, I'm Irish, I like it both ways. But it seems to me the mm. biblical record itself, the Genesis record, distinguishes two very important things. There's a sequence of creation acts which stops and God rests. Now it seems to me that we need to take on board some kind of real distinction between a sequence of creation acts where God is speaking. And that's where I begin to have difficulty with Charles Kingsley's view, although I take the point, it's logically possible. But it seems to me there may be a combination of two things. That is process that God sets in motion, but also God speaking at intervals, and God said, mm. in order to impart the new levels of complexity. And that stops so that we have to make a theological distinction at some level between creation in the narrower sense and providence, that is God continually continuing to uphold it. And one of the things where I think we can see this with a sort of side glance at science is the thing that is pre-Darwin, so to speak, that is the origin of life itself. Because we have lived to see that in, any, in every one of the 10 trillion cells of our body, there's a database. It has a semiotic dimension, as far as I can see. It's written Se in a semiotic? language. It's written in a language. It's got meaning. Yeah, the yeah. DNA code codes yeah. for the proteins and so on yeah, and yeah. so forth. Now, in every other situation, we would argue that that is evidence of a mind at work. Because it's language. Yes. Type, yeah. And where I find real difficulty, it's more with the science in a sense than the theology, although yeah. it's there, is with the notion that matter has somehow got built into it the fruitful potential of producing that language-like order that we find in DNA. Now, God is over yeah. the whole thing. Precisely how he did it, we're not told. But it seems to me there is a real question there. I'm not myself convinced that these kind of notions of matter being able to self-organize and so on, I'm not convinced that the science can bear that. I, I find two things refreshing about what you've said. First of all, that you disagree, I actually find refreshing because these things, there's lots to be done on it and thought through about origins. But secondly, this, this whole idea of um, information coming out yes. and how we account for it. Uh, um, and in, in one sense, is there therefore, at a biological level, Alistair, is there there at a biological level evidence for a God, a mind behind it all? Well, let's take the point that, that John's just made about the, the role of DNA. There's a very famous uh, uh, biological chemical which encodes genetic information. And certainly the discovery of that role for DNA was one of the turning points in, in modern, um, modern biology. One of the things that really 
intrigues me is this. Let's ask this question. How is that chemical DNA able to encode information? Mm. It has to be a very, very long chemical chain. And all of this depends on the chemical properties of carbon. We talk about carbon-based life. And one of the features of carbon, it has this ability to attach itself to, to other carbon atoms and form very long chains indeed. Without those extremely long chains, you can't encode information. What are the properties of carbon had been different? And this brings us to one of these fascinating mm. questions that we can't really answer, which is the universe seems to be set up to enable this to happen. Carbon is the only um, element that can do this. It didn't have to be like that. It could have been something else, then this would not have happened. And this brings us to this whole question of what's called fine-tuning, that there seems to be something about the chemical and physical properties of matter that enable certain properties that are really essential to life to happen. Now, obviously, that, that might prove nothing. It might just be a, an amazing accident. But I, I'm not really inclined to believe in accidents. I think there's something significant here. It's a clue, if you like. And the thing about clues is you have to put them beside lots of other clues and say, where does this take us? And for me, the capacity of DNA to encode information is one of these clues. It's significant. It's pointing somewhere. And I want to follow this one through. Alistair, thank you very much for that last contribution. And I want to draw it to a conclusion there because... In a sense, it's been fascinating to see that within the biological world, there are these clues, these hints that cause us to think there might be something more than the mere material, biological, sentient world. Where's it all come from? Where's the information come from? This sense of order, what does it point to? Thank you very much indeed. Hello, my name is Chris Jervis and I have with me three friends, professors from Oxford, John Lennox, Keith Ward, Alastair McGrath. And we're continuing our discussions on themes related to philosophy, science and religion, the big questions about God. In our last discussion, we looked at the biological level and at the microscopic level in the area of DNA and origins of life to explore if in any measure our observations there could point to the existence of a divine mind behind it all. And Alistair, you made the point in that discussion that almost the process of evolution and the information encoded in DNA, etc., presumes a fine-tuned universe. Unpack the term fine-tuned. What do you mean by that? Well, I think our understanding of the way the universe began has changed massively over the last century. If we'd been having this conversation 100 years ago, the scientific assumption would have been the universe has always been here. That's just the way it is. But since uh, about 1950, and people have really shifted towards the view the universe had a beginning, what we call the Big Bang. And part of the growing understanding of this Big Bang is that it seems that the universe came into existence with certain particular constants of nature, having certain values, which seem to be, if I can put it like this, fine-tuned for the emergence of life. In other words, if the values of certain constants were slightly different, the universe would have changed in different ways and we wouldn't be here today. And the big debate, and it's a huge debate, is whether this is simply a, an accident, whether it's something that's no bearing on anything, or whether actually this has significance for the God hypothesis. The point I'd like to make is that this proves nothing, but it is absolutely consistent with the Christian framework of meaning, with the Christian narrative of how things began. And it seems to me it is a very significant point to make that if the Christian story is true, then something very much like this would have been expected.
To use the term fine-tuned, Keith, let me come to you. To use this term, doesn't it almost beg the question, doesn't it almost imply somebody, you may not like the phrase somebody in mind, doing the tuning, setting it up? Well, it might imply that in ordinary speech, but I, I think the point is just uh, that if you varied, uh, say, the as Alistair says, the f exact force of gravitation, the gravitational force, if you varied that by the tiniest amount, probably a universe like this one couldn't exist at all, and, and certainly carbon-based beings like us couldn't come into existence, as far as we can tell. Now, that's just a remarkable fact about the universe, um, that it looks as though this is hugely improbable. Now, that doesn't prove that somebody had to tune it, but it... it, it uh, as Alistair says, a hundred years ago, nobody realised that uh, the things were so closely connected as they are. For example, if we ask the question, why is space as big as it is? You know, why are there so many stars and galaxies? Why is it so wide? Um, and people got depressed because they thought it was an awful lot of empty space and we're not very significant. But now, as a matter of fact, so a lot of cosmologists, a lot of physicists who talk about the nature of the universe as a whole, they would say, well, since the Big Bang, the universe has been expanding as fast as it can, and therefore it takes about uh, you know, uh, 13, 14 billion years to form uh, organic life, carbon-based life, out of the explosions of stars, etc. That takes that long. So if the universe has been expanding for that period of time, it would be hugely big, as it is. So you've got an explanation for the size of the universe by looking at the way in which the initial laws of the universe have produced organic life. So you've got a new explanation of why there's so much space. Now, that's astounding. Mm. It doesn't show you that God set it up, but I personally think it strongly suggests it. Mm. <laughs> Something very well, we're going to come on to discuss and what yeah, is suggested yeah. by the evidence. Well, one of the interesting things is the reaction of scientists who are not particularly theistic to this. I mean, Fred Hoyle is one of the famous ones. Mm. We talked about carbon-based life, and the whole question was, where did all this carbon come from and how? And Hoyle discovered that it depended on a particular resonance. And he wrote later, when this was discovered, he said, nothing shook my atheism like discovering this. And I have found it very interesting to read people like Paul Davis and so on, who, mm. responding to this fine-tuning, have quite spontaneously said, it looks very much as if there's an intelligence beyond this. And as Alistair said, it's exactly what you'd expect if the Christian um, faith is true. Yeah. I find it interesting, having read most of Paul Davis's books, that he almost seems to be saying towards the end of his books on cosmology, he almost is lamenting, why am I not a theist? All this evidence seems to be pointing towards it. Uh, am I right in assessing him in that way? Well, he keeps his cards very close to yeah. his chest, and I, I don't want to embarrass him by right. speculating on this. But I think what he is saying is, look, don't look at what I think, look at what I'm presenting yes, to you. Evidence. And in many ways he's saying, look, this is very strange, it's very odd, and the big question is, what's the best way of explaining this? And I think it's very clear to me that Davis is really saying the best way of making sense of this is to say that there is a God who in some way is reflected in the way things are. Doesn't prove it. Yeah. But, you know, it is so resonant, so consistent with what Christians believe that we almost look at it and say, well, that's natural. Well, Keith, you introduced a word uh, a minute ago. You, you uh, talked about, uh, well, you talked about the gravitational force. Uh, a bit of a throwaway line. And if the force wasn't just as it is, we wouldn't be here together today having this conversation. Um, but actually, it's even more remarkable than that, isn't it? I mean, there are so many of these constants and so many of these qualities. I, I struggled through a paper, you'd understand it as a mathematician by Reese and Carr, looking at about 30 different constants. It looked like a foreign language to me, but there's a remarkable number of these things, aren't there? Yeah, there are. I mean, Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, wrote a book. Now, just six numbers. Just six yeah. numbers. Yeah. Uh, and he's not a theist, really. He doesn't... doesn't uh, well, at least... As far as I know, he doesn't believe in God. Right. And, uh, and yet he, he says this is so remarkable that it couldn't be chance. It has to have an explanation. Now, Martin Rees, in fact, has a different explanation. He thinks it's incompatible with God or it's an alternative to God. And that is the multiverse theory, which has become right. quite popular now in a way. This universe looks very, very improbable. It's amazingly improbable. Uh, but if huge numbers of universes existed, then, and they all had to exist, right? You have all the possible mathematical universes you can have, then this universe would have to exist. So, okay, can, can given... Okay, does okay, that make I want sense? To stop here. I want to say this. Um, 
The, what's the definition of this universe? All the matter that Our we have access to? A universe is yeah. a space-time system. A so if you're saying there's others, how do we know? We don't. Well, we don't know. <laughs> that's an idea. That's, that's, I think so it's, it's not science? It's very interesting to see exactly what Martin Rees says in this book. He talks about this fine-tuning, and it's there, according mm. to him. And then he refers to Professor John Polkinghorne, who taught me quantum mechanics at Cambridge years ago. And John Polkinghorne says that he believes in a theistic interpretation. And then Martin Rees goes on to say, I prefer the multiverse theory. Mm. And mm. that's very interesting. Mm. It's a preference. We're going beyond science here. And the very interesting thing, as Polkinghorne points out elsewhere, is that these putative universes... We've no access to them. We've no connection with them. Is there an idea? So they're an idea, yeah, yeah. and they're a very popular idea these <laughs> yeah. days. But perhaps this shows my bias. It shows how desperate yeah. people get to avoid the God conclusion. Yes. <laughs> okay. And you know, one of the cool. things that strikes me is it's very important to say that when you're asking about God, you're asking about the creator of this whole universe, this whole space-time. And one reason why some physicists who come very close to God don't like using the word God because they don't like the local vicar, okay? Or they don't <laughs> right. like what goes on in their local church. And that looks relatively trivial by comparison. And I think we Christians need to remember that we're talking about the whole universe and the creator of it. We're not just talking about the garden fate or, yes. or you know, what we, what we uh, actually <laughs> prefer to do on Sundays, exactly. So there's that, the question is, does that God, the creator of the universe, for which I think most physicists would now say, well, you know, it's pretty good... Pretty good evidence for that, uh, even if it's not overwhelming, it's pretty good. But how does that relate to the God of prayers and yeah. churches? And that, I think that's why Paul Davis remains... Mm. Uh, it, possibly, yeah. it possibly is, but I think it's worth pointing out in addition here that often the multiverse hypothesis is set up in opposition to God. Now, that's logically uh, flawed. Because, of course, God could create a multiverse, for all we know. In other words, in itself, the hypothesis is not anti-God, and it's often presented that way. So let me get this straight. We have an incredibly improbable universe with remarkable values, constants, forces, all of which indicate that it's so remarkable, we're either incredibly lucky, aren't we the lucky ones sat here with just the right conditions? Very few accept that. Or you've got the notion that there are uh, an infinite number of universes, so one of those universes is going to get it just right, and we're again the lucky ones, we're here having the conversation in the universe that gets it right. Or there's a God behind it, or some combination. Is that the choices we've got? Well, those are some of the choices we have. But I think that the, the really important thing to try and get across here is that nobody actually knows the answer. But nevertheless, the whole thing is so suggestive that it means that the simple assertion this just happened and that's it you know it really leaves you feeling very unsatisfied it's mm. not that simple okay. that would and undermine science exactly yes. it's exactly. not that simple exactly and therefore we have to say look it's not that science is wrong it's just maybe science is inadequate maybe there's something else because in the end you have to say look if the universe came into being did it just happen or did somebody make it happen and really that, that's the big debate that's going on but this is one of the examples yeah. of what Alistair was saying earlier of science within its own self-imposed restrictions beginning to raise questions beyond itself. Mm. Ah, this that's, that's important isn't all there is. There's something more. And that's important because I was fearing that if we say this universe is vastly improbable, what's caused it to be? Well, let's ah, we'll pluck out God, fill in that gap. Because we can't get beyond that boundary, so let's have God fill that gap. Is there a danger that we're being accused of this God of the gaps? Well, there is. There is a danger, and uh, most scientists are very well aware of it. And I think it's therefore very important to emphasise that God is the God of the whole show. It's not in the things I don't understand that I see God. But, for instance, the very fact we can do science, to my mind, is one of the biggest pointers that we've got a rationally intelligible universe that we are capable of processing and understanding it. That, to my mind, is one of the biggest evidences. And the more scientific results we have, the more that evidence piles up. Yeah. But if you impose an artificial limitation on science, 
then there will arise certain gaps, just as you will never explain the semiotic character of writing, the way it carries meaning, if you insist simply on analysing the physics and chemistry of the paper and ink. In other words, the meaning of the writing is a gap in the explanatory power of the physics and chemistry. But if you rise up a step and include intelligence together with physics and chemistry, then you can close that. Sometimes I talk yeah. about good gaps and bad gaps. The bad gaps are the gaps that science closes, but there are good gaps that science opens, and I think this is one of them. It's pointing beyond itself to yeah. the notion of a God behind the whole show. Could you put it this way, John, possibly, that God, the idea of God, is never going to complete a physical or scientific theory. It's not going to be part of a scientific theory, but to, to explain how and why the scientific theory works at all, that's where exactly. God comes in. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, who was it that said, I believe that science explains, but I postulate God to explain why science explains? I think that it might have sense. been Professor Swinburne. Ooh. You know, <laughs> that makes sense. So we've got this improbable universe. We've got the fact that you've got this multiverse hypothesis. You've got the God. In one sense, two, two questions I've got. Let me ask you this, Alistair. Is multiverse suggestion a scientific suggestion? And secondly, is it an alternative to God? Well, it, it is in one sense a scientific suggestion and it's putting forward a, a way of making sense of things which is there for debate and discussion. And certainly you could argue that it arises from a genuine scientific debate about how to interpret what we know about the initial conditions of the universe. What I fear, though, is that some atheist writers see this as a way of getting round the obvious fine-tuning of this universe. What I just need to say is, actually, the multiverse doesn't get rid of God at all. Because it's the multiverses, if they exist, exactly. don't need to be explained. Exactly. You just, you just, in effect, move on one step and say, well, yeah. how do we explain that? But the second point I think it really is very important, and it's this, that really this whole debate that we are having is a new debate. Um, so we couldn't have had this a century ago. And very often we're told science has moved on and made belief in God even more difficult. Where we are today is much closer to the God hypothesis than where we were a century ago. It's moved in our direction. That's not being adequately told that story in the media. It's shifted, it's raised the big questions, it hasn't answered them, but it's given them a new vitality and a new importance. I remember in the 1960s when the Big Bang Theory was first being introduced, and I remember the then editor of Nature, Maddox, Sir John Maddox, resisted it fiercely because he said, we cannot have this notion of a beginning to space-time because it would support those who believed in the Bible. Now, that, to my mind, is a supreme irony because for centuries, Europe has been dominated intellectually by the belief that the universe has always existed. The Bible has been saying for more than centuries that there was a beginning. It just could be that if people had taken the Bible a bit more seriously a bit earlier, mm -hmm. they'd come in the Big Bang Theory sooner than they mm -hmm. did. And this is guys who espouse science and uh, love science and all that it's teaching us are enforcing this or, or backing this opinion. Keith, I want to come up to you. Um, explanation. If, uh, taking Alice's point, that if we have this notion of multiverses helps us to understand or explain um, our universes and the very fortuitous circumstances that enable carbon-based life to develop, is that an explanation? Postulating multiverses, does that explain? Or you well, I think it does explain. going one stage back, you know. Yeah. It, it does explain, but you're paying a huge price. For yeah. a start, you're, you're breaking the principle of economy, you know, Occam's razor, as they call it. But Occam's, explain. Occam's razor says <laughs> that you should postulate as few entities as possible in an explanation. Yeah. Well, having an infinite number of universes is not quite postulating as few entities as possible. That's positing as many entities as, as you can possibly think of. So it's a strange sort of explanation. Uh, and then it's an explanation which is uh, we could never verify, as far as we can see, how do you confirm there are other universes. And then I think I would say this, that uh, if our universe is very improbable indeed, and presumably all the other ones are very improbable indeed, that it doesn't help to explain 
this universe to make it more probable to say that you've got an infinite number of improbable universes because that would be hugely improbable in itself. So you're not really explaining very well. It's an explanation, but not really a very good one. Let me just take the last few seconds with you, Alistair, and ask you this. Um, staying with this issue of explanation, you talked about going a stage back. Isn't there the danger that we're accused if we say, well, God is the explanation of all this, that the obvious next question is, well, in, who's explaining God? Or what explanation is there for God? I think one of the great quests of modern science is what's called a grand unified theory. Mm. A theory which explains everything, mm. but doesn't itself need to be explained. In other words, there is this fundamental belief we can track everything back to this one theory, and that answers everything. In other words, this theory explains, but it's explained by this, it's explained by this, and then the buck stops here mm. with this big theory of everything. God's like that. There's no need to say you can't have a grand unified theory, theory of everything, because it needs to be explained as well. No, you're saying at some point it stops. The same is true of the Christian faith. Yes, maybe raising this book by me explains how the book came to be raised. You track it back, but actually at some point it stops, and that's what God is. The same idea is there in science. It's not an inconsistency. Mm -hmm. I think we need to say that there is no inconsistency in saying the buck stops with God. And well, the same is true of atheism. Exactly. The buck must stop here in terms of <laughs> our discussion. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. I mean, basically, in those last two discussions, we've just looked at the whole notion of design, be it at the macroscopic mm -hmm. level of the universe or the microscopic level of biological life, and saying that this makes sense with the God hypothesis. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, my name is Chris Jervis and I'm introducing now the eighth in our series of discussions based on themes related to philosophy, science and religion. It's the big issues to do with God's existence. In this last discussion I want to have with uh, our friends from Oxford, Professors Lennox, Ward, McGrath, I want us to look at what we may reasonably infer from all the evidence we've accumulated and gathered and examined. But before we do that, John, there are clearly going to be a number of people listening to this who will say talk of God, talk of any particular faith, is a delusion. What would you say to that? Well, what I'd say to that is that we need to analyse it very carefully indeed. Obviously, in their background of their minds when they make this objection is Sigmund Freud. And there's been a very interesting book published recently by a leading German psychiatrist called Manfred Lutz, and in that book, he says, if there is no God, then Freud will give you a very good argument that God is a projection, a wish fulfillment, and so on. That is, provided there is no God. But then he goes on to say that if there is a God, Freud, on the basis of exactly the same logic, will give you a brilliant argument why it is atheism that's the flight from reality. And then comes the killer stroke, from my point of view, where he says... But on the question of whether there is a God or not, Freud cannot help you at all. So the first point I would make is the delusion argument cuts both ways and can only be settled by a matter of evidence. Now, what now interests me is that Richard Dawkins, as we all know, wrote a book called The God Delusion. But it seems to me that if you're going to describe faith in God as a delusion and you're not a psychiatrist, it would be worth consulting the psychiatrist. And one of the most interesting books that's come out recently is by a former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, Professor Andrew Sims, and he deals with this most interestingly. And he points out after a lifetime of experience, whereas, of course, the content of faith can be delusional, that faith of itself 
ultimately is not a delusion. And then he refers to many studies, in fact, meta-studies, of the positive benefits of faith in God. Now, the interesting thing is, if Dawkins is going to do a scientific analysis of it, I think he would come out with a very different opinion from what he did. And finally, to suggest that faith is a delusion, as Andrew Sims points out, is a very risky thing to do. Because there are many people, Christians, for example, who have psychiatric problems and their faith is a very living hold for them on reality. And we need to take that into account as well. But the bottom line is this, Freud doesn't settle it. You have to go for evidence, the kind of evidence we've been discussing up until this point. I was going to say that brings us full circle back to evidence and what we might infer from that evidence uh, is faith in God. And we may move on to discuss which particular God or understanding of religious truth um, is most uh, viable. Um, let me ask you this, Keith. You've had a, a lifetime studying philosophy. We've talked about reasons. Is faith, or religious belief, reasonable? Well, reason isn't an abstract thing which tells you the answer to anything. For something to be reasonable, it has to be consistent, it hasn't got to be self-contradictory, it's got to be coherent, it's got to be consistent with other knowledge that you have. Mm -hmm. If you pass those tests, then what you believe is reasonable. And, of course, many religious beliefs are reasonable. Some are unreasonable, but it's the same with politics. Some political beliefs are mad. Uh, some are more reasonable. So, you know, how, assessing reasonableness yeah. is assessing whether it meets the canons of logic and whether it... The processes we're engaged in. Yes, yeah. so it's, it's a matter of process, yes, right. reasonableness. So, of course, some religious beliefs are reasonable. Um, that should go without saying. Well, if it's a process, we're looking at the processes, we're looking at the evidence, as John reminds us, we're looking at what we may infer from that evidence. I've got a lovely quote here from Paul Davis, whose books I've enjoyed. Science offers a surer path than religion in the search of God. That's taking us back, Alistair, to some of our early discussions about how science might point to God. What do you make of that uh, quote? Well, certainly in my case, uh, that is a very powerful quote because, in effect, what changed me from being an atheist to being a, a Christian was reflecting on the natural sciences. And I wouldn't want to say this applies to everyone, but in my yeah. case, it certainly rings true. And I think it might be instructive to compare myself with Richard Dawkins, who tells us that science leads away from God. In my case, it led to God. I think the all-important question here really is just to say, look, um, in talking about faith, we're asking what is the big picture that makes most sense of things, including science itself. And for me, one of the most interesting things about uh, believing in God is it gives you a sort of mental map or a viewpoint of reality where things seem to fit into place very, very well. And I wouldn't want to say that faith goes against reason. I think that's simply untrue, and I agree completely with what Keith has just said. Mm -hmm. But there are points at which I think faith goes beyond reason, where in right. effect you're sensing, look, a reason is pointing us in this direction, but it's almost as if it runs out of steam or it falters, even though you can see where it's going. And faith in one sense is having the courage to go where reason would take us, but doesn't. So not in the face of reason, but beyond the scope of it's reason. It's transcending yes. reason, not mm. contradicting it. It's taking yeah. reason, it's like firing an arrow, and the arrow just hasn't got enough momentum to go all the way, but you can see where it lands and says, just beyond that, that's where I want to be. Yeah. Faith is that extra mile. Yes. Now, gentlemen, we, all four of us, um, hold a Christian faith. And we've made or set out arguments for the fact that theism is a perfectly logical and reasonable hypothesis to hold, given the evidence. But let me take us beyond that. Why should we espouse the Christian understanding of that theistic position? Is there other things which sharpen that focus? Keith, anything? Well, I'd start by saying this. If you do think that the idea of God is a reasonable one, there might, you just have the theory, the thought, there might be a creator of the universe, and if so, that creator has a purpose for the universe, there's a reason why the universe exists. So you'd want to know what that purpose was. Well, there'll be one anyway. Now, wouldn't it be very, very odd if there were such a creator, and the creator didn't tell anybody or give the slightest idea what the purpose was? So revelation, and this is the yes. word yes. <laughs> I'm looking for, really, revelation would be that God, the creator, in some way, 
making it a bit clearer what the purpose of human existence was and perhaps helping people uh, to achieve that purpose. So I would expect, if there were a God, this hypothesis of God would lead me to expect some revelation, some disclosure of the purposes of that God. So I would start looking for revelation. Uh, and I would think one of the most obvious places to start, since the oldest record we have of religious life in writing is the Hebrew Scriptures, is the Bible. Uh, and I think that Christians make a claim, of course, that in Jesus you see a revelation of God's purpose and, and God's nature in mm. the person of Jesus. So there's a claim, uh, and I think you ought to look very carefully at that claim. So you're looking at historical evidence, uh, you know, claims made about the person of Jesus, in, with the expectation that if there were a creator, God would be doing something like that, and it would be very unlikely that God wouldn't reveal anything. In a sense, that's we're a going, start. Right? It's a start. It's, it's taking us back to, uh, I forget which of you gentlemen mentioned it, the two books. Um, Francis Bacon and I think Galileo both had this notion that God speaks to us in two books, John, wasn't that? That's right. So yes, it does take us back to that, and I think it's important to realise that when we speak of revelation, we haven't left the domain of reason and rationality. Mm. Even at the most trivial level, you cannot read the Bible without using your mind. There's a very popular idea that once the word revelation is mentioned, it means close down your reason. I prefer to look at that as another source of evidence. We've been talking mm. up until now about the natural world, the cosmos, it is a source of evidence. But the Bible is also a source of evidence and we're invited to use our mind on it just as much as we are on the natural world. But I would, uh, following on what Keith said, say that if there is a God behind the universe, it's perfectly logical to think he might reveal himself. But we wouldn't assume that he's less than we are, subpersonal. Mm -hmm. personal, so there comes the possibility of a genuine encounter with God on the basis of all of this. And that is, of course, the next logical step. And faith that we've been talking about at its highest, in a way, is that final step of commitment to a person on the basis of not knowing everything, but having sufficient confidence that here is where I want to place my weight, here is what I want to commit myself to. And for me, the central piece of evidence about Jesus Christ is his resurrection from the dead. And that was always the heart from the very beginning of the Christian faith, because that opens up that huge worldview question. What about life after death? Is this mm. all there is? So that's further evidence. It's, it's bringing the whole issue into sharp focus. Alistair, you um, spoke earlier in one of our discussions about the fact that uh, your atheism had been disturbed by your examination of the sciences. And in one sense, or their inadequacy, in one sense to take you all the way to a fuller picture of meaning. Uh, but what about this revelatory uh, thing which um, both John and Keith are referring to, this top-down? It's not just bottom-up exploring the natural world, but this top-down, this notion of revelation... How has that helped you to acquire your Christian faith? Well, I think it's a very powerful idea, and I think John and Keith have explained it very well, because in many ways it's saying, look, we are questing, but we are not questing unaided. It's not as if mm. we're questing for someone who doesn't want to be found. Mm. It's rather someone who, in effect, is, has studied the world with clues, with signs, which excite us and make us think there must be something more. And then, although we are looking, we are also looking for someone who is looking for us. And for me, one of the most remarkable things about the Christian faith is this focus on Jesus of Nazareth, because here we see God entering into human history, coming to where we are, meeting us in a person, in history, in order that we can actually see what God is like. And so to spe speak, Jesus is God fleshed out, so we can actually see what God is like. And that, for me, is very, very important. It doesn't negate science at all. It doesn't negate the human quest for wisdom. It's saying this quest finds its fulfillment mm. in God and in his revelation in Christ. So for me, Christianity honours this quest for wisdom, but says to us very graciously, on your own terms and under your own steam, you're never going to really get there but you aren't on your own. Revelations about God's gracious decision to come and meet us 
while we are trying to find him. It reminds me very much of some words of Terry Eagleton in one of his books, that reason is not wall to wall, it does not take you all the way. So this notion of revelation. You introduced the, uh, the resurrection as a piece of evidence you mentioned, historical evidence, Keith. Can any of you suggest other reasons why a person might look and find evidence for the existence of the Christian God? Other people, of course, and other yeah. people's experience. We, we don't live on an island. And I think that following up Alistair's notion of us being on a quest, it's always very important to interact and engage with other people and talk about their experiences and the whole tradition, history. And those all stack up and help us understand this personal encounter kind of thing. One of the things that often occurs to me, and I think I mentioned it once in a debate with Dawkins, that I could scan him with the most brilliant scanner available, scan his brain, but I'd never get to know him that way. I'll only get to know him if he opens himself up to me. And it seems to me the heart of this matter is that God in Christ has opened himself up to us. And we can therefore make that last step and connect. Mm -hmm. But the experience of other people can help us enormously to understand what's involved in that. Thank you. Any other contributions? Well, one point we could make is that sometimes we're moved to think certain thoughts because we've tried the alternatives and they haven't really yes. worked out. Yes. And certainly in my own case, and I know for many others, um, it is the existential and rational unsatisfactoriness, for example, of atheism. Atheism leaves so many questions unanswered and actually deep down it doesn't scratch what people itch. That doesn't prove it's wrong, but it does raise the question, might there be other ways that actually might meet these deeper needs? Yeah. And I think I wanted to say that one of the most obvious things about human life is that it's very often selfish, egoistic, hateful, full of hatred and greed and possessiveness. And that when you come to know yourself, you realize that you're not free of these things. <laughs> and it, it then becomes a sort of quest, not just for who made the universe or did anything make the universe, but how can I escape? How can I be liberated? How can I be saved from that hatred and greed and egoism? Is there any way of finding something, a more valuable sort of life and a life that would be turned around to a greater degree of altruism. And I think that's where Christianity meets many people. And the person of Jesus comes to save, to liberate, to, to say that it stands with you in all your failure and missing of the mark of moral mm. perfection to help and to assure you that uh, you can find companionship with God. So that personal experience is really very important uh, for lots of Christian experiences. And, in the end, you know, to be personal, that's, uh, that was, as well as all the worldview stuff, yes. that was the stuff that uh, made me... Uh, it it's personal to you. It's yeah, it was a personal, yeah, yeah. personal thought of, uh, yeah. well, I, you know, as Christians like me say, I might be bad now, but you should have seen me before. <laughs> <Yeah. There's, So. laughs> there's a big realm in the way this opens up that we haven't discussed, and that's the moral realm. Yeah. And coming to terms with ourselves as moral beings, because at the heart of Christianity is not only the resurrection of Christ, there's the cross of Christ. Mm. And the whole question that any religion has to face, how can a holy God, how can I have a relationship, an imperfect man, with a holy God? And it seems to me that here also there is a tremendous, I believe, unique and true answer to that very deep question of how can I find acceptance and love and opening up all those possibilities. And through Christ, there is, it seems to me, the answer that makes sense in all of those levels. Mm. Well, that's very helpful indeed. I, I must say I've contributed very little in terms of my own views and standing on this, but certainly I came to faith through a reasoning process persuading me of the reasonableness of a God through scientific inquiry, etc., and the reasonableness of the notion of revelation, that, that God should speak to us, that uh, sense of convergence between that revelation and the reality I encounter in myself and the world, and then, as you said, that third part, that personal commitment, that trust or faith. So if you like, as you're saying, it's not reason and faith being posited one against the other. It's reasonableness leading me to faith and trust.
I found these conversations very helpful, gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed. And it's quite clear that uh, anybody watching these will not necessarily have found everything as satisfactory and fully dealt with as they would wish. But I would hope that those who have been watching would find in them sufficient to cause them to question further, discuss, debate and reflect. And it might be that some of your contributions, your books, would help in this respect. And it might be that those who are watching this will want to read further contributions by you gentlemen. But for now, let me just say this. Thank you, John, for all that you've contributed. John Lennox, Professor of Mathematics at Oxford. To you, Keith, Keith Ward, Professor of Divinity and a, a lifetime uh, philosopher working at Oxford. And to you, Alistair McGrath, uh, again, a theologian, biologist by background, and for all that you've contributed. And I do hope that those who have watched it will find this both instructive, challenging and helpful. Thank you. Thank you.